meeting to order. Uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, and I don't think there are any changes to the posted agenda. Does anyone have any information different than that? Okay, great. Um, all right, so moving on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, comment on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be great. Also say your name and uh, where you're from. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna look at Cameron here and see if uh, anyone is, is raising their hand or um, otherwise indicating they'd like to speak. So if you would like to speak, um, you can either unmute yourself um, and start talking because we don't really have a cue right now, or you can use your raised hand or a reaction emoji and I will I will find you and call on you. Oh, Bill. Bill. Just quickly, I know we're gonna have a formal conversation with our legislative delegation and we will welcome them all as that, but I thought it'd be fun to welcome two former mayors to our meeting tonight. Oh, you beat me to we it. To Mayor <laughs> Yay. It's so, it's uh, delightful to have you. <laughs> um, all right. Anyone else? I'm not uh, Jack. Uh, Jack, I think you are muted. I uh, still can't hear you there, Jack. I'm going to assume that we should probably move on unless, Jack, you can jump in later with whatever comment you want to make. Um, he just said he has to, he texted me he has to call and he thinks he's having, he's having some trouble there. Oh, okay, great. Is Thank his mic you. turned up? Okay, well, whatever he, he needs to do. He's working on it, he'll, he'll try. Okay. All right, so anyone else? No? Okay, all right, so moving on. So uh, we are on to the consent agenda for today. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to accept the con consent agenda. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Um, and so now we are up to uh, welcoming our legislative delegation. So thank you each for, for joining us here. Uh, I, I know your, your names are displayed here, but I wonder if we could take uh, just a second to have you each uh, introduce yourselves, and then I'm going to turn things over to uh, our uh, committee, our legislative committee, and uh, let them uh, take it away. But if we can start with some introductions, that would be great. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to call on folks in the order that you all appear on my screen. So I apologize if that's not the same order that it shows up for you. Uh, but uh, so I guess we'll start with... Um, uh, Senator Ann Cummings. You're on. Yeah. <laughs> been out of practice. It's been a whole week <laughs> since I've been on Zoom. Um, it's a privilege to be here, and thank you for having us. I'm one of the former mayors, so it's always good to come home and um, see how the city is running. Seems to be doing well but looking forward to an update. Great, thank you. All right, next up I have uh, Representative uh, Mary Hooper. Hi all, it is great to see you. Um, like Ann, I'm feeling a little rusty after, we, we were looking at our Zoom statistics the other day and I hate to tell you how many thousands of hours we have, we have logged in the past couple of months, so. Anyway, um, it's good to see you. 
I, I'm not sure what you're looking for in terms of, of an introduction other than a hearty hi. Um, uh, just as a reminder, I serve on the House Appropriations Committee and I'm also on the Joint Fiscal Committee and in uh, the off session, well, I'm not sure when that is, I'm on the Joint Justice Oversight Committee and I know that you all have some interest in um, some justice related issues. So I look forward to talking with you all about those interests. Thanks. Great, thank you. And actually I think that's really helpful to have that context of what uh, committees you're on. So I'm gonna back check and uh, yeah, Anne, would you uh, tell us what okay. committee you're on? Yeah, um, I chair finance, which deals with property taxes, uh, which may be of interest. And then I'm on health and welfare. Those were the two longest, most hours in the Senate logged on Zoom. So I now know why I was tired. Um, I also cha uh, chair joint fiscal and we're doing a lot more than normal this year um, in the way of approving COVID grants and staying on top of things. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so next up I have uh, Senator Anthony Polina. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's always nice to see you folks. I look forward to actually seeing you in real life one of these days soon. I serve on government operations and agriculture. So government operations, as you know, does a lot to do with local communities, municipalities. And we did a lot of dancing around to try to make it easier to, for local government to function during the pandemic. But um, it's nice to have the opportunity to talk with you guys for a while. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and so next, I have uh, Senator Andy Perchlick. Hi, thanks for, for having us here. I'm the newest senator, just finished my, my first term. I was served on transportation, and we can talk about some transportation projects. And then also I'm on education. I have to say that it's pretty good for Montpelier to have two former mayors, Montpelierites, on the Joint Fiscal Committee. It's almost as good as Danville having each chair of the Appropriations Committee, but that, that, that <laughs> so Montpelier will now have its They've own. got an even tighter connection than our former mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thanks again all for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to either Connor or Lauren, or um, I forget who else is, oh, Dan, yes. Uh, so yeah, take it away. Great. Well, I, I can kick it off. And it's great to see everybody. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, you know, it's, we, we're at San Yan Zoom instead of at the State House. Uh, but we started we started this legislative committee um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, had our first meeting, and I, I think really we want this partially just to be an introduction, um, and hopefully the first of many opportunities we can invite you to council. Just get an update on what's going on, and try to keep our thumb on the pulse of the State House as much as possible. Um, you know, certainly I think the, the big things we want to talk about are, um, you, you've seen yourself, we recently cut $1.2 million uh, out of our city budget there with a the rescission plan. Uh, some very difficult choices we had to make. Um, and I, I think, you know, we, we see the big numbers coming out from state government of, you know, where's the money going, what's going to businesses, what's going to workers. And I, I was hoping, you know, maybe we could have a bit of a discussion about what opportunities exist for maybe Montpelier to tap into some of these resources um, and what we should be doing to advocate uh, at this level in the state house, just with the last few weeks of the session coming up here. So I, I think an update would be great of what's on the table, what's coming. Um, the other thing I'd love to hear is, um, you know, the one thing I think we have a responsibility to advocate for is the charter changes. Um, and, and the one that comes to mind is, you know, the non-US citizen voting. We, we had citizens in our town uh, knocking doors, uh, getting petition signatures, really working at a grassroots level to get this over the finish line, get it on the ballot. Uh, we had some success in the house getting it passed. Um, we really feel like, you know, it might be a small number of people this impacts, but it's very real and very meaningful to the non-US uh, citizens in town to feel that connection to their community. And we heard from a few of them. 
So um, I, I guess would love maybe Senator Polina to touch base on that too. And uh, so th that's what I would love to hear. I'll turn it over to Lauren and Dan if, um, if there's anything else I'm missing for tonight. For my part, I mean, I think that's the big things and really excited that you're here. And as Connor said, hope this is really an ongoing conversation and we can kind of re reignite more regular contact with you all um, and be in better touch uh, moving forward. Um, so appreciate your, your time and being here. I know you've been so busy. Um, I think just one other issue that I know um, Representative Hooper mentioned was uh, racial justice issues as well, which have been obviously top of mind for a lot of our community have been um, a, an issue of a lot of discussion in city council meetings in recent weeks. Um, so if there's um, just an update of what the state's doing and if there's a role for the city to be playing um, in advocating for any of that or uh, in how we're moving forward with our own look at um, the police department and other systemic uh, racism issues. Uh, yeah, Bill, go ahead. Um, just, to, just to add on a couple of things to that one, uh, specifically to do with policing, we know there was some discussion on where it ended up about requiring body-worn cameras. And I think generally our city has been very supportive of that, but there are some pretty significant costs uh, associated with that and also Supreme Court case about public records. So just wondering where that was at and, and if what thought was given to dealing with those um, obstacles for local governments to adopt this. Um, curious where TIF legislation is, and uh, I think you know we've got an article coming on. One of the very next items is a, a street closure for some rail work, uh, rail siding. I think Senator Perchlick, in particular, had been involved in this, and, and now it's happening. And uh, and we may be in, incurred with some costs. Uh, so I don't know what we can do about that, but it just seems like um, sometimes you wonder who's looking out for the local interests and the, the public interests on some of these rail pro projects. So I don't know how, how we can talk through that. And last is talking about funding, you know, every, I, I would be, I would lose my municipal government membership if I didn't ask about, you know, highway funding structures and grants, uh, because that is the lifeblood, not only for us, but lots of other municipalities. So. We won't get kicked off the league board this week. Um, before we jump into responses, um, Dan, did you want to add anything from the committee? Yeah, the only the only other thing I would add is, you know, I, and I'm sure um, uh, Representative Hooper and Senator Cummings, you remember this from your days in the the council. We did come up with a legislative priorities list earlier on this year. Um, and if we haven't shared it with you, we would certainly like to share it with you. Um, it does sort of encapsulate a lot of what we've discussed between the, the four of us, um, as well as sort of the overall uh, points that the city has as, as far as its, its legislative priorities. No big surprises. Um, you know, funding, I think, can't be emphasized given the sort of circumstances of where we are in the city um, and the need you know, as we face these budget shortfalls based on lost revenue and and increased needs in some respects, um, but I won't I won't belabor any other points. But I I will echo uh, the gratitude for uh, the the four of you coming tonight. It, it's really great to have an opportunity to connect with you as our representatives, and I think it's uh, a great start to continuing this relationship. So thank you all for coming. Great. So, and we can start with anyone um, who would like to to jump in with a, a response or thoughts. Uh, Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I'll go back to what Colin said because it's it's an issue that the non non citizen voting issue, charter change was for me a major disappointment. It was really hard to like see the Senate hesitate to do that. I mean, it, it's it's in government operations we get charter changes all the time. And generally, the feeling has been amongst the members of the committee that if a community decides to do something, who are we to tell them not to do it? You know, they want they, they voted on it, they discussed it, they have meetings on it. Who are we to tell them they can't do charter changes? So we, we they're almost a given that they're going to pass. This one just really got stuck in the Senate. We discussed it numerous times. Um, we 
actually discussed it uh, informally and formally. We talked about it at two different caucuses, went back, had a lot of back and forth about it. There were members of the Senate who felt that, I think what it came down to was that they felt that voting was a privilege that you get when you become a citizen and you shouldn't be giving it away to people who are not citizens. It was just, I mean, I, I don't want to go on about it. It was just really frustrating, but we never, we did vote counting on it a couple of times. We, we, I asked everybody how they were going to vote on it. We were a couple of votes short. We talked about it at another caucus a couple of days later and they did the vote count again and we it just wasn't going to pass. We always turned out to be two or three votes short of passing it on the floor of the Senate. So rather than bring it up and have it be killed in the Senate floor, we never really voted it out of the committee. It was really, I was definitely disappointed. And as an aside to that, what it makes me think, and I think it's something that you folks are also thinking about, which is, you know, more home rule or local control for communities. We did actually pass a bill, it might be S106, I forget the number, but it set up a, um, a pilot, prog pilot program where 10, 10 municipalities would be given the ability to do more of their own decision making, for lack of a better way of putting it. There were still hoops to jump through but it would allow you to make decisions without coming to the legislature all the time for charter changes. And that bill passed the Senate um, and it had strong support in the Senate, pretty strong support, certainly strong support on the Government Operations Committee, but it is now stuck in the House the Government Operations Committee. They're hesitant to move it forward. So it's just interesting how these things, how you split these hairs. I mean, on the one hand, the House Government Operations Committee said yes to non-citizen voting but no to giving local communities more power and the Senate did the opposite. So I just wanted to mention that there is this bill out there, which is still in the house, which would allow communities to make more decisions without coming through the legislature as often as they do now. Um, Connor. Yeah, Anthony, that bill would be uh, great if we got that over the finish line, I think. Um, that would give us a lot of flexibility. Is, that, is there still an opportunity, would it make sense for us as a council to send a letter to Jeanette White there uh, to ask for a vote on this and in the next few weeks, actually pressure if it's just two or three votes with the Senate to try, try to get a vote on this? Or? You're talking about the government, the non citizen voting. I mean, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's six or half a dozen. The other. I think if you are inspired to write a letter to the committee and asking them to bring it to the floor, um, I'd say, sure, go for it. I think it's a long shot because the leadership, certain members of the leadership don't want to bring it, don't, don't want it to come up on the floor. So it depends on how you want to spend your energy. I mean, I, I, I was prepared to present it on the floor. I, I thought we were pretty close, but close doesn't necessarily mean you win. So I, I, I don't want to discourage you from writing a letter or making a statement, but I guess I'm just saying realistically, I don't know if that if it would make a difference be quite honest. You may want to think about that strategically. I think it's worse to have something voted down than to just be left right. on the wall and picked up again next next year. Um, right, which is why we didn't. We never brought it to a floor vote because we thought we would lose. And once you lose the floor vote, it makes it harder to bring it up again later. Um, Andy, did you want to jump into that? I was going to say the same thing that oh, okay. Mary Great. just did. Great. Um, Dan? Well, I just say, I, I think this is this is where um, building a better relationship with, with you as the um, legislative delegation, because certainly if there's anything we can do to move the needle with members, you know, to have conversations with them. I know on this particular bill, I actually gave testimony um, in part because an early issue about constitutionality. Right. Um, and Peter Teachout and I were, were able to testify about, you know, the constitutional um, qualifications and why this didn't offend the Vermont Constitution. Um, you know, so if there is, you know, especially something like this where there is something, we, we would certainly welcome the opportunity to make the case for these type of things, even if it's, you know, obviously as a city, we can't expend money on it, but we're certainly here and available to have conversations with people. And it's, I think it's a great, thing that we could do, given the strong relationship that, you know, we have with all of you um, to be able to have some of those conversations with other other members who may not be fully on board. Yeah, we, and we heard good testimony and also there were some citizens of Montpelier who came in and talked to us and made a strong case. We also talked to, 
I forget the a community in Maryland. I forget which one it was, but who have done it for a while and they, they voiced no problems with it. So we, we had what we needed in a sense. What we didn't have was the commitment from enough senators. We had enough information, I think. And I think you guys did a good job of coming in and making the case. But there were just some people who just really got stuck. They weren't, they weren't gonna move. So you all asked a couple other questions that maybe I can just tick off. Um, on the highway funding, we put in 100% funding um, for local high, for highway budgets in the quarter one bill, knowing that the um, that 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 money needed to get out the door. So rather than doing it in you know a quarter and a quarter and a quarter, we we pushed it all out for you. Um, on the body camera question, and Anthony, maybe you know this better, but I'm pretty sure that the that the only issue with body cameras was for the state police, and we did it not was. make them. Everybody's nodding on that, right. so that's not an issue. We, we didn't press that, push that burden back down on you. Um, there was um, a, some money that we put also put in the quarter one budget for community justice centers. And I'm expecting because Montpelier CJC runs a transitional housing, helps with transitional housing. I think you'll see, you, the way it was set up, you should see an extra about 22,000 for that, as well as 250,000 divided 14 ways just to help with some um, 14 way, 18 ways being the number of CJCs in the state. So 18 divided into 250 for kind of what we called COVID related issues. Um, so we tried, I tried to figure out how to push some money down in that way. And we also did, and I think this was in the supplemental budget adjustment, um, 600,000 for community-based programs like diversion and CJCs. Um, the Department of Corrections may use a little of that money for some of, to supplement some work they're doing. They're still sorting that out. But we generally tried to figure out a way to move some money down into the community. The one thing that I need to check on is, and we had funding for the police social worker that we were going to share between Barry and Montpelier. That was set up in the original budget that we were ready to vote on on March 13th. Um, it was part of a federal grant and it should still be there, but I need to confirm that with the Department of Mental Health. Um, so no promises on that. A question I had for you all is given, I mean, Connor, and I, believe me, I understand this budget cutting pain. Um, the, the notion behind the police social worker was that the Barry and Montpelier would add a bit of money to that. It, if the money is still there from the state, is the money still there from you all? Yes. It is great. Okay, so I'll I'll track that down and I, fingers crossed that it's still there. Um, I really am looking forward to kind of figuring out how to continue to enhance those sort of services. I'm anticipating an interest, a growing interest in alternative sort of services instead of traditional police. And, and I, I, I hope you all can give me, give us some guidance on what you would like to see there. I expected for there to be a push to put more social workers in the state police barracks. And that's good, but I don't know if that's the best way to try to put those services in place. So uh, any advice and insight you have on that will be welcomed because I do expect that will there'll be somewhat of a push to consider that when we do the rest of the budget in August and September. Um, so Bill, yeah, go ahead. On that topic, and Mary, you and I had this conversation I think earlier this year, but 
for everyone's benefit. Um, and I, I, I think this actually relates a lot, at least to the local conversations about policing. You know, I, some of the national stuff is just pretty abhorrent, but you know, a lot of our police departments here in the state have become the de facto social service agencies. And, and this hasn't happened overnight. This has been since the 80s, the, the gradual cutback or from the state and federal funding of social services. So we're dealing with substance abuses on the street. We're dealing with homelessness. We're dealing with family issues. We're dealing with kids in, in crisis. So, you know, whatever can be done to to, to increase and help, you know, those are those traditionally were state provided services and, and the locals, you know, we just kind of got what was left over and more and more and more that's being pushed on us because there just aren't the resources to deal with them. So whatever you all can do to actually support the state human services efforts is going to help local governments here in Montpelier certainly, but all across the state and, and take some of this pressure off policing because there there certainly are plenty of times when they're dealing with things that another agency could could handle a lot more directly than than they can but at three in the morning they're the only ones out there <laughs> and, uh, and so that's who's getting the call if someone's flipping out or someone's abusing someone or someone's intoxicated or whatever that's who's handling it and then they're trying to get them to into the social service network and yes can our social Social worker help, absolutely, but you know, we're still it's it's a pebble in an ocean. Um, Anne, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mary. Did you have anything to follow up on that? No, let let Anne go. But I okay. one thing that we should talk about is housing money, which is related to trying you know the pebble in the ocean. But let's let Anne go. Okay. No, I was just going. I was just going to say, doesn't sound like things have changed in the last twenty plus years. I used to say you needed an MSW to be a member of the Montpelier Police Department, and that was when we, the state, had closed the state hospital, and we knew where an awful lot of the former residents had gone. And the Montpelier Police Department was left to deal with it. And to the best of my knowledge, um, when I was there, I was always very proud of how they did. Our, we still called the Montpelier Polite Department. I know we were called that at one point. And I think we do, you know, it is easy to, to kind of kick the problem down the road. No one wants to raise money. Um, it's a painful thing to do. What you're not picking up, the schools are picking up. And we have a, a crisis in both areas. And the question gets to be, um, how do we fund it? And, you know, and what do we cut or what do we raise? And it's, it's a hard issue. And right now, while we're talking, the state is looking at, Mary, correct me, I think the general fund is at something like a $200 million deficit. The uh, property, the education fund, uh, we were at 150 million. Um, looks like people ran out and bought big appliances with online with their uh, bonuses. So we're down to just 100 million, but that's somewhere between a 10 and a 12 cent property tax increase to cover. Um, we know we can't do that. We know people can't handle that. But when we go back, we're going to have to cover the deficits in both, fu in both funds. And right now, you know, it's been like Christmas. We've had federal money to hand out. Uh, but it's almost all handed out. And it's um, it, it's going to be a rough few months in starting in August because we have essentially kicked that painful can down the road. So if I can continue, one of the questions was, what can we use from you? And I think 
I've been fielding questions for the last couple of days from sole proprietors who are not happy with the lack of funding that they're getting. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how do you give money to tenants or do you give money to landlords and how, how is it working out? And you're the ones that are really in touch with downtown and what's happening in downtown, who's coming, who's going, what it would take to make them stay um, and let us know. So then we have some actual data to be making decisions on. I think that would be very helpful other than we're saying, well, it must be like this. Um, so getting some really concise information from you would be very helpful. So before um, we keep going, I'm just keeping track of uh, comments that you all or questions that you all brought to us. So, uh, so Mary, just thinking about your question about um, social worker uh, embedded in a police department and potentially in with uh, uh, state police, I, I guess I would just say on that point, I mean, we're still learning. We think this is going to be uh, a value add to the community. And um, I think that it makes sense for us anyway. I think we'll probably check in about that in, in, in another year after we've had some experience with that. But And you're probably aware of this, um, but uh, just in case um, you know anyone out there is not, uh, we also did uh, hire a, a street outreach um, person to work specifically with our homeless uh, population. And so that um, that's also new this this fiscal year. And I, I think is have some, uh, again, some real value. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact um, both of those uh, positions make. So something to follow up about in the future. Um, and then um, coming back to your, your question, Anne, about uh, having specific data about how is who who still is in trouble and who's um, uh, whose needs are not being met? Uh, you know, it makes me want to connect you with um, uh, our the Montpelier Lives uh, Recovery Coordinator, uh, Jean K is it Kissner something like that, um, who would be able to I think provide some specific data. Have you met with the downtown development people sure um, development maybe community. two weeks ago yeah okay. not quite the same yeah sorry go ahead Dill. Yeah. yeah so it's a different entity and and there's i think they well they may be tracking similar things but uh it'd be good to get both perspectives i think they the uh, recovery coordinators uh, that role is really intended to help uh, connect businesses with uh, all the resources that are out there. And so presumably any business that is still struggling uh, to, you know, make, make it all work is hopefully going to be in touch with that, uh, that person. So uh, uh, Jay, did you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. I'll just uh, throw in there. And just so you know, Montpelier Live actually put out a survey this morning to all their member um, businesses um, downtown and otherwise looking for specific data um, you know what grants have you gotten what loans have you gotten how many employees do you have are you breaking even when do you expect to break even so like it's a very data-driven survey so it just went out I don't know probably nine o'clock this morning so I think that so I can connect you with Dan Groberg I think they're, they're putting together a lot of those specific or that those data points to help you know, guide some of these bigger decisions. That would be very helpful to get a copy of once it's done. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be sure to connect you. Thank yeah. you. Um, super, other um, thoughts from uh, from folks? Uh, let's go, uh, Senator Polina and then Warren. Yeah, just to jump around a little bit, I wanna go back to the police thing just for a minute because there's another angle that we've been looking at it from as well, where we've added members to the Law Enforcement Training Council group to try to create more diversity and, and change some of the operations of the law enforcement training council so that our officers who come out of the council come out of the training program are better equipped to deal with some of the social issues we're talking about 
adding members who represent the Human Rights Commission organizations such as that, the Racial Equity Director to, to the Law Enforcement Training Council Board, but also to encourage them to come up with a program that would require prospective police officers to actually do internships and work with a mental health agency or some other street agency before they become police officers so that they get that there's that you know that way of experiencing what's going on on the streets as well so i think that's just something to keep in mind um would there also i think we put in there this was in a miscellaneous law enforcement bill i think we put in there as well uh, requiring a group to come up with a way to um cooperatively buy body cams so that they can reduce the cost for communities who are going to use them. Um, so that's, that's another thing. The other thing I, I want to mention, and I'm not sure where this is going to come from, where, where are you going to go to get this, but we did allocate $13 million for municipalities to try to recoup some of the money that was lost due to COVID-19. So I'm not sure exactly what that will cover, um, but that there's $13 million there that is going to go to local communities, municipalities. I'm not sure yet where it's, you know, what agency is going to come from and what the guidelines are going to be, but that's something to keep keep in mind as well. $13 million, they, we, we, we had allocated it, then it got cut back in the House. We were able to put the money back in again in the Senate. So that's something to keep an eye on. So, and that specifically could potentially be used for lost revenue. I mean, that's no. something that, no, okay. That's, that's, that's kind of what I had. <laughs> I know, that's stick on all this stuff. stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just thought I'd clarify yeah. that. Go ahead. They're not nice. making it easy. Yeah. That's the feds. Nice yeah. try, Mayor. <laughs> what you should always be trying to do. If you can make an argument that you, um, are, that it's covering business disruption. Sometimes you can back into it. And, and that's also part of the reason the, the money for the local governments was structured the way it was, is because it was being um, organized in a way that you could, you could take advantage of it, that the feds wouldn't make you pay it back. That's our big, big fear, is being forced to pay this money back. So they're, they're right. giving you money, but they're making it hard to spend the money. Yeah. It's very frustrating. So, Mary, um, if it's not for deficit, what's it for? Do you have some? I guess I didn't hear clearly what you said you could spend it on. Business disruption. And, Business and so disruption. I, I, I've not heard that phrase used around local government, but certainly all of the economic recovery monies have been used, have been framed as business disruption. The reason that we, the, the money that we are trying, that we have allocated for the community justice centers and um, the, those other local efforts we have framed as um, needing to do cleaning or to buy tablets or you know trying to make it fit into that framework of how you're having to reimagine how you're providing services. So the CJC have to um, you know reorganize how they're working with clients, and so that's how we justify that. So going forward, if you can think about how to you know, the services that you need to be providing, if they're different services, then maybe there's an argument that therefore they could be covered by CRF sorts of money. Right. Um, there's 140 million that we left on the table in anticipation of, of different guidelines or needing or, or different needs. Um, the, Best part of the world would be if the feds would send us another pot of money. If they do, it will happen really rapidly. So if you, I mean, and, and none of us know what the guidelines are going to be or the limitations. So we're, we all need to be really ready to kind of think creatively and smartly. An example of something that would not be approved, I talked with the Barry City Council and they were looking at the money they've lost because they could not rent out the BOR building and you know, other, other lost revenue that they were trying to recoup. And they were pretty much told that that would not be appropriate. That's a helpful analogy. Thank you. 
or comparison. Um, Lauren, I know you've been waiting here a little bit and then Andy. Yeah, I was just hoping to hear a little bit more about, we've touched on homelessness a couple of times, but I know that some really kind of creative and impressive work happened um, to house people and we just love an update on kind of where things stand and what you see coming up. And, you know, the city has been allocated money for homelessness services or um, the street outreach worker that we, that Ann mentioned um, and some other kind of flexible dollars. So just getting a sense of what, what the city's role might be and what the state is doing right now would be really helpful. So I, I can jump in on that maybe. Yeah. So we, um, the total housing package was about 83, was $83 million. <laughs> 23 million went to the Vermont, Vermont Housing Conservation Board to, and that was their estimate of what they would be able to push out the door and have expended by December 30th, which is the deadline. They had $56 million of applications and they're, I, I, I can't imagine how hard they're having to work to push that out. There um, is, I, I'm not remembering the dollar amount, but a good deal of money um, to help with um, rental assistance and, you know, kind of doing first and last for people or covering um, some rental loss. Right, that was another, sorry to interrupt, that's $25 million. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was really impressive. Yeah, so thanks for that, um, Anthony. Um, helping with utility arrearages. So Anthony mentioned what we put in and they increased it on the utility arrearages. We put in, I think, 20 million and the Senate reduced it. Um, to about 13. And that's just the give and take between the two bodies, but we were trying to pay attention there. And then we also did, and I think it was 13 million for um, rehabbing uh, homeless shelters. No, it's not, that's a wrong number. It's not 13. 13 was something else. Um, maybe it was eight or 9 million to help out specifically with rehabbing um, some homeless shelters and, you know, enabling them to take clients again. Uh, and then finally, uh, a package that was put together that will enable the state to wrap some services around people needing how you know, needing more of the ongoing housing services. Um, and that will last for beyond this, you know, December 30th. And I'm particularly excited about that because that's what it's going to take to make that sort of fundamental shift in housing and, and, and providing homes for all Vermonters. Um, I haven't asked, had an update recently from the Department of Children and Families, which is kind of the locus of, of this work. But I know that they were preparing to um, become, go back to their more prescriptive guidelines and expectations in terms of people's behavior in, in housing that they were providing. Um, and, uh, you know, during the height of the pandemic, there, it was a pretty open-ended um, uh, set of, of rules that there weren't any rules, really. They were just trying to keep people housed, which I'm thrilled that they did. I think we're all thrilled. But, but they are um, beginning to come back to and have expectations of meeting certain standards if, if people are receiving services. Um, so you may begin to see and maybe have already begun to see some disruption there, you know, changing in the way services are being provided and, and the way housing is being provided. And I think, I, Huge kudos to DCF for how hard they have worked to make this work. 2,000 people were housed um, during the height of the pandemic. And if everything falls in place, uh, at least 1,000 people should be seeing how opportunities to have 
homes as a result of this money that, that has come down the pike. Maybe, maybe even more, but just adding up what people were saying that they were creating, it's, it's, it's close to a thousand. And there was no COVID positive homeless people during the whole time, which I think Vermont was the only state or one of the few states because of the quick action of DCF to, to get them all into hotels and things like that. Yeah. Um, Andy, anything, um, uh, you had had your hand raised earlier and if you. I don't have anything else on, on the homeless if, that, if, if Anthony or Ann want to talk about that or to the house. No. No. Um, well, I just wanted to say it is great that we are talking about it. It would be good to do it at the beginning of the session, obviously. I hadn't seen the legislative agenda. They did send it out for this meeting. So that was interesting to read. Of course, it would be maybe more helpful to read earlier and then have discussions how it, how it goes along. So I hope we can, if we're all still, you know, senators next year and representatives, we can uh, we can do this again in January and, and follow it along. Um, but I wanted to answer a couple things that have happened so far the, on the, on what it's Donna's question about what it can be used for. I mean, my understanding is like anything that you can really tie to a COVID expense, not lost revenue, but if you can say that this was an expense you wouldn't have had if it wasn't for COVID starting back in, in March, then you, you can count that. So it, you can be creative, kind of like Representative Hooper was saying about what, what you call for and what you put it in there. But uh, I, there, there's an opportunity there to pace this. So even like your the mental health worker in the police, maybe that's needed because of COVID. You know, there's there might be ways of trying to make an argument for expenses. It can't be that because it can't be anything that was budgeted prior. Um, but anything that's coming out new. And, and you can put you can you can use that money for it but i think it's going to be like the business grants there's going to be more need from all the towns across the state than there is money to meet all those needs unfortunately but we do have that money that representative hooper talked about that was left on the table and so we do have some time left to talk about new things and how we could maybe get more money for municipalities or direct it in a certain way that's going to help municipalities and and specifically those in, in Washington County. But one thing I did notice on your legislative agenda, the number one, which I don't know if this is prioritized by the list, but was uh, support for microtransit. And we did get support for microtransit. So we met your number one priority, I wanna put on the record. So we got $400,000 for microtransit and, and, and some, uh, the, you know, VTrans is committed to that and that money is going to help uh, hopefully kind of do some promoting and other work. So I think we're looking pretty good at making sure that that popular pilot project will happen. Um, on the railroad, I, I would call it, I don't know if you're talking about the siding or you're talking about the new runaround, they call it. I think you're talking about the new runaround. And so, but I think there's going to be issues with the siding in the future that it would be good for the city and myself to talk more about about how we can work with VTrans to avoid problems with the siding and, and if there's uses for the siding that we don't want to see happen or that we do want to see happen. And I don't know exactly what the issues are with the costs of closing the road so, or the new so the crossing. Issue, well, so the issue is, you know, the runaround, I guess we were thinking of that as the siding and the current, you yeah. know, as the main rail. Um, and, and we've known that they were talking about this. And, and you know, you remember we had a meeting with the state and it was, it was well, we're designing, we're gonna come back in and mm -hmm. seek money and you know, we'll see what happens. We don't have a specific schedule. And then it, you know, we, we understood that the, the, the state, from what I understood, the state gave the bridges to, they had some money to repair the bridges and they gave the bridges to the railroad so now the state doesn't have to worry about them. And, they're using that money to do build this siding, this uh, runaround. So they just started building it. And, it, you know, I think it was a complete shock to all of us. And as part of the, the deal is anything that's going underneath it, water sewer lines, all these stuff have to be dug up and sleeved and all these things. And here we are in, in the middle of the pandemic cutting things. And they're like, oh, yeah, and you have to do this. You've got, you've got to incur these costs. 
to so we can build a rail line that you know we didn't know certainly was coming this year and aren't, aren't totally convinced of the need of but that's not really our our place so uh, it's you know this has happened and we've now worked out a deal with them and the street closure for it is on on the thing so you know um but it's to me it's kind of and when we met with them and had a talk with them in vtrans it just felt like um you know vtrans was really sort of actively advocating for the railroad and not the public interest and hmm. uh, and so the question is how do these things happen without oversight and um and what role is there if any i mean i realize the rail has a lot of um flexibility and they provide a lot of great services you know we're not anti-rail but it certainly impacts you know savings pasture development uh, potentially you know, all those kinds of things so my my sus suspicion is that they because of that meeting and because we were starting asking questions about it that given the opportunity they just started building it so <laughs> To, to avoid that, frankly. Um, and to have some conversations with the mayor of Rutland about the uh, underground utilities under railroad crossings, they've had some, some big battles. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, it just seems like if that's their project and this has to be done, it ought to be part of the cost of the project, not yeah. just dump, you know, not dumped off to somebody else who's unexpecting it. And I mean, that seems at, at the minimum, but also, it is troubling because it, one way or another, it's public money. Whether you know, I mean, I, I, there's whatever money VTrans has already paid them, they're now using to build this thing. So now it's their money. So I get that, but it just, yeah, and I, had, I had heard that about the bridges. So well, maybe Bill, you and I can talk. Uh, yeah, about I don't want to get. I get more detail, and I can reach out to my contacts. And there, are, there are others here that can explain it in more detail than I. Okay. Well, let me know who I should talk to and I'll. Um, or, you know. uh, I think I had seen a hint from Dan. Yeah, I just had a, a quick question on, not on the railroad, but on the issue before. You know, when we talk about the, the funding or um, monies that are available, you know, how open is the legislature going to be when you reconvene to if a municipality has a special project that clearly fits in to the COVID related, if we wanna bring, you know, sort of an individual project as opposed to the, the block funding that has been given so far, um, you know, so just as a stalking horse for this conversation, um, you know, we've faced as an issue, uh, a reduction in public restrooms downtown Montpelier. Um, the city hall has been closed businesses have been closed. And so, you know, we're reevaluating, uh, I think as a city, you know, what are our public facilities and which we wouldn't have had to prior to the COVID outbreak, but of course in the post world. So if we came to the legislature and said, hey, we need, this is a funding project for something that other, but for COVID, we wouldn't have needed. Um, how receptive do you expect the the your committees to be in when you come back in August and September to those type of requests? So, as you guys know, the appropriations bills begin in the House. Um, our modus operandi is to ask our policy committees for the appropriations committee asks the policy committees what's your advice on what we should be doing? So if you are interested in a particular issue, you, you need to be having conversations with that policy committee. And you know, so that's, that, that's a great project that ought to fit it is. within, yeah, I, I'm, I think that's cool. Um, it, and you're probably the only, we are probably the only town that's going to suggest it. So it's a little hard to see how, how that could work. I, I honestly was disappointed that we did not do more for towns in kind of a general block grant way. Um, and, I, and so Bill can put his League of Cities and Towns hat on and think about what the opportunities are there to maybe position yourselves better. 
Um, generally, we tried not to do the very specific allocations um, because it becomes a feeding frenzy at that point. And we wanted to broadly say housing, healthcare, you know, broadband, these broad areas, and then trust the folks within the executive branch to put it out there. But let's talk about those sort of opportunities and figure out wh wh how to fit them in. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just want to talk toward that end about funding because and, and I, I don't pretend to speak for every town and city, but certainly the, the folks that I'm in contact with, I think this is pretty consistent, is that most of the municipalities did not see a huge amount of direct expenses from COVID. I think most of us were expecting to. We were expecting that our police and fire folks were all going to get sick and, and you know, have, be out in waves and we were going to have tons of overtime filling shifts and trying to deal with medical things and, and that just didn't happen. We didn't actually have anybody out. Um, so, you know, we had a handful, you know, we've kept track of our expenses, but they're in the tens of thousands. They're not massive. You know, we put up the plastic things in the offices and those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and we are tracking them, but I, I understand that the lost revenue is a hard sell and I realize a lot of that's a federal thing. But what that really means is that's roads that aren't gonna get you know, fixed. And, and I mean, deferred maintenance, deferred things, programs that aren't getting done because that's, which is the same as what you're doing at the state. But it's, it's so there are expense, there are costs, but they're not, out of pocket. We just didn't have to buy that much. And I think that is across the board. You know, we didn't have a lot of payroll, you know, absurdities. In fact, if anything, we reduced our payroll because we furloughed everybody. So I, I don't know what you can do about it, but that, I think that is a common theme with local governments, that, you know, to be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. I, I was hoping that we'd see more for the downtown organizations, okay. you know, so kind of the the ancillary work, you're, you're right. I, 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 I totally understand the core services for municipalities, but I, you know, I, I'm always going to be a fan and promoter of downtown and those sorts of issues. And I just didn't hear a strong voice for them being core to the recovery that our, our communities need. Yeah. Interesting. Um, any further thoughts for anybody? I, uh, one other question I had just for somebody I can talk to later, also on your list was about dispatch. And as a former volunteer firefighter, I'm somewhat interested in dispatch. So if people, I, I know it's a constant issue about the, the regional dispatch thing, but, but there might be an opportunity because of the COVID and, and costs to to finally do something about it. So if there is somebody particular on the council or in the city that wants to talk to me about what the city wants to see as far as dispatch, then, then let me know. You know, I, I feel like, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, to me, we're all in this together. None of us have enough money to cover the cost and, and do what our businesses need and catch up. And it's going to take some creative work and some creative thinking. And I think the more we talk, if we could set up a way, um, you know, so that I know I used to be up at the state house at eight o'clock and anyone that knows me knows I hate eight o'clock meetings, but we were there for coffee every Tuesday morning to talk to people when we were trying to get payment in lieu of taxes, which was probably as difficult um, as trying to get your non-resident or non-citizen voting. Um, but some, some way so that there is regular, because I am pulling a blank on railroad sidings and it's not in any of my committees. I have no idea that there's an issue there for the city. So it would be helpful just because, you know, well, 
if we ever get back to normal, we have lunch and we talk in the halls and, um, you know, to be able to put in a good word or to, to, to do some work there person to person would be helpful, but you need to know what's going on. And I think the more we talk, the more we talk with the businesses, um, we all want to do everything, but we're all looking at very limited resources right now and a very unknown future. We haven't even talked about the schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also haven't talked about how long it might be before state employees really come back to Montpelier oh. as opposed to working at home remotely from now on. So, I mean, I really worry about restaurants more than anything. I mean, I worry oh, yeah. about businesses, but restaurants, I don't see how they're going to, I just don't see how they're going to do it. I mean, I, if we could find some ways to support them, particularly because they're so much part of the culture as well as the economy, it's just really horrible to think about the amount of debt they they're racking up and how, how hard it's going to be for them to come back online. You know, before I, before we, I want to go back. Connor's been very quiet since we had that initial conversation about the non-resident vote, non-citizen voting. Something I don't about know, the non citizen stuff happening. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I hope I didn't bum him out or anything, but um, when you said something, if you feel like writing a letter, Connor, I was going to say is write it to the president pro tem, not to the committee, because to move a bill out to the floor of the Senate is, has to go through the rules committee these days. And so yep. the rules committee has to say, yes, it's okay for GovOps to vote this, this bill out of the committee and bring it to the floor. So, and it's really the president pro tem that is, you know, you'd have to address if you were going to, don't pick on Jeanette White, Jeanette, tonight we'll, Jeanette will support it. But the president pro tem is where the sticking point is. And I, I really appreciate the strategy on all this. And I, I understand losing a vote could actually be detrimental. Uh, but I look at the possibility of going back to the advocates, advocates who went door to door on this and started sure. from the very beginning after going through all these committee mm -hmm. hearings. And I think, you know, if two people vote against it, I'd like to know who they are so we can talk to them for next time around if that's, if that's the way we go. Sure. I hear you. Um, just uh, getting back to uh, Senator Pritchlick's question about dispatch. Uh, Donna, can I... Um, uh, nominate you here just uh, as the person who'd be a good connection to talk about dispatch. Yeah, um, he's, on, he's on my list to be in touch with. Andrew okay. Hall. Great. Super. Okay. Well, uh, anything else here, team? Okay. Well, thank you again all for uh, taking the time. Oh, sorry, Bill, did you want to say something? No, I, I, I just wanted, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse or get too into the weeds. And I really appreciated Senator, P Senator Polina mentioning that there was a, a thought of, of sort of go, groups going in together uh, to purchase body cams, you know, to, to get some savings. I, I will tell you, and you've probably heard this, but there are two really big costs or, or, or hurdles. And it's not really purchasing the cameras. It's the digital storage of all the data right. after, you, after you buy them is really expensive. And now, um, and, and of course, everyone, you know, we're all in favor of, of public transparency and access to public records. But if you're familiar with the case in Burlington where, you know, somebody asked for a full eight hour shift of video from a police officer, which then required a supervisor to watch the full eight hours to figure out if they were active investigations, if they were juveniles, they, you know, things that needed to be redacted. And Burlington sought to bill for that time. And the Supreme Court said that's not billable under the way the public records law is currently written. And so frankly, that put a stop to body cameras in Vermont uh, from local police departments because of, of that cost and the sense that, you know, people could just want to, I want every officer's shift because I want to put it on YouTube and, and the cost of processing that and looking at that. So I, I, you know, whether that can be addressed in the public records law or somehow, but those are, those are the funding costs that we're most afraid of. I think the cost of purchasing the cameras is fine and the philosophy behind them and the policies we're in hundred percent agreement. So th those are not insignificant hurdles for local departments. And if the state is going to mandate, body cameras for all police departments, those are going to be huge issues and costs for local governments, which we may not be prepared for across the board. 
Yeah, you no, know, you're right. We are. We that has come up. We are thinking about that. We don't have the answer yet, but the cost of the digitization and the how long it has to be stored, all that kind of stuff, is on the list of things that we're trying to figure out. Appreciate it. Just to be clear, S two nineteen doesn't mandate the city get right. right. It's only yeah, at one point that was being talked about. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. It only but, it's only state police that'll have them now. Well, in anticipating that it may just be a matter of time before it is, um, sure. or or even yeah. yeah, that just that there are um, these are the things that uh, I'm sure you all you all are already considering some of these things for the for the state police as you um, you know way wade through that, but um, certainly those are the things that we we're thinking about. Um, right, yeah. it's a good practice. We'd like to do it. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you are muted. Even though his thing doesn't so muted. Yeah. No. Some with your microphone. Have you and while while Jack's trying to unmute himself, um, <laughs> I was concerned about the cost of storage and heard when we required the state police to do the cameras that it's come way down. And so if you haven't investigated lately, something has changed. Still hear you on all of the on the other issue, but the storage issue, something's changed and could be worth looking into. That's really good to know. Thank you. Um. Uh, I, my understanding was that it, it, it's really the review time. And that's in the Supreme Court case that uh, Burlington uh, fought against that, that sort of free access. It was not so much a storage as the review, because you, you are talking about lengthy amounts of time and mm -hmm. involvement. And because you're dealing with law enforcement exemptions as well as any other um, exemptions at play. That becomes that becomes a cost, and it's it, it's baked into the law. Um, you know, and I think th this is one of those things that you know, public records law is a tricky balance, and you start to start to change some of those things. I know the AG's office has talked about some of those changes, and it, it has ramifications well beyond that that simple issue of you know can we can we charge for this particular video redaction um because it's it deals with the inspection of public records but those are um those are obviously concerns that we have as a local municipality as to who pays for this if there's a mandate that does come down that would be a huge huge amount of resources on our part and 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 maybe this is a pitch for uh, a you know greater uh, funding for public records. Um, you know, the, having a public records officer for municipalities to to use, so that somebody could be uh, funded to to do that, not just for the city of Montpelier, but for any any municipality. Um, you know, some states have that where they fund those type of public records officers, so that. You know, people can have free and easy access to these records and inspections, um, and the state just builds into its process that cost of reviewing it. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Oh, and then Connor. I mean, I don't know how you have the state requirement. You said you are requiring the state police, but yet have you dealt with these issues with the state police as far as their cost and their time for public records. And for me, one of the other issues is once you give it to somebody as a public record, do you really want all that on YouTube? So I, I feel like there's a privacy issue on both sides that we have just not dealt with. And I think that really has to be dealt with before we start putting more body cameras on people. Yep. Yeah. A great question. Uh, uh, go ahead, Connor. Jack was just asking if uh, Cameron could unmute the phone number 734-3851. That might be the culprit. Okay, thank you. Um, hey. There he goes. Um, with regard to the storage, what I've been thinking, I would like to see 
all municipal police have to have uh, body cams. And I was thinking that a good uh, bargain might be to require the police to purchase the cameras and have all the data storage be at the state level. It's a way to aggregate the costs. Um, just an idea to think about. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any further comments or questions to your team? Okay. All right, thank you all again for taking the time for meeting with us. And I, I think, um, I mean, th so this is the first time since, oh gosh, well, since I, I've been mayor anyway, that we've done, uh, had a, a legislative agenda. Um, and so I anticipate that we'll, we'll probably put together our agenda again uh, prior to uh, the next session and hopefully meet with you um, sooner. I, I, uh, Andy, I think mentioned uh, January. Is that sort of the right time or is sooner better uh, to meet with you all and to chat about our, our, what will be our, on our agenda? Well, it's good to do it before we reconvene. So yeah. January is okay, but January would be better to do it in like early December. Right. So that way people can think on it. Or if you want to introduce a bill, you know, that kind of there's deadlines. So to yeah, January. Yeah. January is not too late, but it's it's ideally it would be before that. The Senate deadline hits in November on a yeah. lot of years. So, but it it really you know other than giving us an agenda, just talking with us and helping us to understand the issues, like oh yeah, you've got to pay someone. And I'm thinking sitting here thinking, well, if I call the police because there's somebody in my backyard that shouldn't be there. I don't know if I want myself in my nightgown at two o'clock in the morning on YouTube. I mean, there are some privacy issues there. Um, you know, do I get to have a say if I get to be on YouTube or not? You can't put my picture, you know, you can't take your picture for the newspaper under, for certain circumstances without a sign off. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one and we haven't caught up with technology. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's, I, that's a good call. I learned that's... a lot tonight. <laughs> Am I being heard? Oh, um, uh, Alice. Hi. Uh, Hi, would you, would you like to? It sounded as if you were about to secure the meeting. I, I came in because I did want to uh, comment on something that was posted uh, related to John Clark. And oh, I we have not yet taken up yeah. that, that oh, topic. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. I <laughs> no didn't problem. want to have this happen and you go away and I not have an opportunity. So I'm going to mute myself again. Let me know. Okay. Super. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you all. And I, I hear you about uh, having just uh, more informal conversations, uh, particularly as uh, the next session approaches. So um, thanks again for your time. And uh, hope thanks you for all your hard work, the local level stuff yes. is so important. Thank thanks you. for all the time you put in at the legislature. It's really, you know, this, <laughs> this year in particular. Not really... an easy time to be a policymaker these days. Yeah. It's pretty true. bizarre. Um, but yeah, Vermont is one of the few that has figured out how to do it. And I believe true. we were the first. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And we were just voted the number one state to live in. Um, right. by, uh, we knew that. Right? Poll and mm -hmm. CBS or CNBC. Right. So we're okay. doing it right. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks right. a lot. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good Bye. evening. Um, all right, so we're going to take up uh, the next item, which is the Vermont Rail Systems uh, Berry Street closure. Um, and uh, to that, I, I think I'm going to turn it over to Bill probably to explain this. And we were sort of just talking about it a little bit, but a little uh, bit. Um, although it, the good news is I think it is figured out, but Tom McArdle is on. And
and he's really leading this effort. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pop it to Tom. There he is, and uh, he can explain what what we do. But so so you know, I think the general issue that I was concerned about is that these things can happen, and suddenly we have to re respond with finances. The good news is we've worked out a plan that doesn't hurt us too badly. And take it away, Tom. Hello, everybody. Hopping in. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> this is part-time project manager, yeah. Tom McArdle, for those of you who don't know. Yeah, I've got my uh, abbreviation after my name is JT now, just Tom, not director. <laughs> so I'm just project manager helping out. Um, and Kurt, I believe Kurt Monica is on still, city engineer, deputy director. So Kurt handles our... Um, utilities um, for us, um, engineering side of things, the technical side of things, and um, I'm helping on more of the administrative piece. And with this um, uh, agenda item, the traditional, usually a, a traditional request for a street closure approval under the um, under the ordinance. And um, <clears throat> I thought this would be uh, so. This is a public hearing. If people want to want to speak to this issue and, and the request is on behalf of Vermont Rail Systems, um, but it's not purely for their project. Uh, we are compelled under the, um, the master license agreement that the city has in place with the state and signed on by the railroad. And a master license agreement is, uh, allows all the, our utilities to pass through a, a rail right of way um, and includes water, sewer, um, if we have a district heat line um, and storm systems. So with all of those utilities, we pay an annual fee um, for the right to pass through those, uh, through those rights of way. Um, the passing through the right of way requires that we comply with uh, ARIMA standards. Um, and that abbreviation is America Railway, American Railway Engineering Maintenance of Way Association. Um, and those standards are quite rigid um, because of the rail traffic and the heavy live loads that pass over them. So the city is uh, compelled to upgrade our utilities and that was the um, unforeseen costs that, that Bill spoke about um, and is in the um, agenda as the uh, expenditure required portion. So the um, couple of things on updates on this. The, the request for closure has been amended. I'm not sure if you saw that, but we received an update um, related to the delivery of materials uh, that is delayed. So the um, closure is now expected to be um, on July 20th and then would continue for seven consecutive days after that. Um, one of the other updates is um, thanks to Kurt's good work. Um, we were looking at um, a project, um, one that was, uh, we were essentially being told we had two options to use for the um, improving, up upgrading our utilities. Um, typically, we would put our utility work out to bid, uh, receive competitive pricing. Kurt was able to um, scurry around and get another price. Um, so we, we have a significantly less cost, uh, hopefully hoping that will be uh, less than 100,000. But nonetheless, it's a project that we weren't anticipating. Uh, these are water sewer utility funds, the enterprise funds. As you know, we have a 50 year plan, to bring our water and sewer systems up to snuff um, current standards, uh, the water supply rules, um, our aging infrastructure. So this is not really where we wanted to spend our money. Um, I suspect most of you would agree with that. Um, so you understand where we are with, with particularly our water systems, but also our sewers and our, and our combined sewer overflow efforts. Um, so this will take a hit um, to, those, uh, to those funds. Um, and that's probably the, the biggest issue besides the lack of real staff time available um, to uh, support this project. Uh, they're going full steam, have been since um, they showed up in, I think, March. Um, and uh, so we're trying to catch up and keep up with them. And 
so I won't go on any further than to say that um, that project will uh, will go um, we'll first do the utility work using our contractor um, and then uh, they'll complete it with uh, putting the new tracks in um, and then complete the connection um, right in front of Caledonia Spirits. And that will become the active rail for moving these heavy, heavy cars. Um, their, their contracts, um, we're told, is to move grout, the granite waste from um, Graniteville and elsewhere where they have it stored. Um, the bridges are um, not structurally sound to support those heavy loads. And so that's um, the idea. I guess they'll use that. They'll call that Washington County Rail as the siding. Uh, what becomes of that rail, um, they're not clear. Um, what, uh, what will be done? Will they walk away from it and abandon it? We don't know that yet. So this, this track along in front of Sabin's Pasture and, um, and on the north side of the Winooski River avoids both rail, um, river crossings. So that's the, the benefit of it. Um, I believe this track was last in use in the 50s. Uh, there was a lot of litigation over it. Um, and whether it was abandoned, I think it was finally settled by the courts with the Pioneer Street Bridge project, um, and that's another story. But um, so we certainly weren't anticipating uh, this, and um, but we're going to keep up and get the work done, and um, seek uh, your approval. Um, take any questions if you have any. Okay. Um, well, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing before I forget to do that. Uh, and uh, I do have one other question that I see Dan um, has a hand raised, uh, but I'm curious if there is any um, representative here for Vermont Rail Systems, um, they wouldn't mind just giving a quick shout out to say hey. I'm not seeing anybody. Send them in like to rail, but I don't think they're going to be uh, attending the meeting today. I'm going okay. to speak, speak for Kurt here because he's uh, texted me, said that he has wireless internet service and it's it's spotty. So uh, we'll cut out, and as you can tell, his voice wasn't real clear there. But I think what he said is that they were invited there. We're aware of this meeting, but um, but chose not to attend or are not able to attend. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dan, go ahead. So a couple of questions, Tom. Um, one is, is this something where we have to follow their timeline? There's no ability for us to push back or extend times if we want to um, maybe delay in, you know, some of this work for budget purposes? Uh, no, uh, we did ask that question and um, they are moving forward. Um, um, to paraphrase them, but um, essentially don't need our approval to do what they're doing. Um, and that's why I included the legal uh, clause in there, the references. Um, the, the unfortunate part of that is if uh, we wanted to delay and budget for this, um, that we certainly have that option. Uh, we could defer bringing our utilities up to ARIMA standards, but it would be much more costly once the rail is active. Uh, we would have to jack and bore, and, and so there's a, there's a lot more effort to this. Um, we are actually, and I should have pointed this out, Kurt probably was going to mention this, but we are actually only doing the sleeves and putting the lines in place. Um, the So I should back up. It probably will ultimately be that closer to the 150. We're putting the sleeves in and the utilities, but we're not actually connecting them right now. Um, because of the rush, we, we really, that would be a bigger project. We've got to shut down the water main, test it, do all that other work with it. So, um, so to answer your question, yes, we could delay it, but it would be a lot more money. Okay. And do it while the road is closed, um, it would be, uh, it will go much quicker this way. So we thought if we're going to feel the pain, we'd feel the least amount of pain. Okay. And then um, I think you partially answered my next question, which was, are, are we talking about, you know, just in this Berry Street area? Um, are we just, and are we just talking about electrical utilities and water and sewer? Um, or are there any other sort of structural issues that the city has to address, say, like the culvert? 
Um, no, it's a good question. Um, and the culvert, um, big culvert on Berry Street was uh, replaced after Irene event. And the end of the culvert that passes on through the railroad right of way was designed to meet um, rail standards. So that was because it's in the right of way, that was a requirement. For our municipal utilities, we have uh, two sewer lines. One is a gravity main and the other is a force main. And we also have a, uh, a water main. The water main's uh, probably the oldest of the utilities. The electrical is aerial. Um, there is a buried telephone, but I don't think buried, the buried section of that passes through this, um, this portion of the, of the railroad line. Um, from a from a bigger picture perspective, um, it's not that this work wasn't entirely not envisioned. We had um, included this area in the TIF projects um, as uh, identified need to support future development. So we had planned, as Bill pointed out, the um, utility work would actually be funded through the TIF program. And when we come back, we're asking for five years before we actually have to occupy the, the new uh, steel sleeves that we're putting in to give us time to actually fund that um, to support the development, whatever that might be, um, Sabins or elsewhere in that area in the TIF district. And that's my, my last question is that, that these utilities are, are for the areas along either side of Berry Street to serve them. Just that's so correct. Yeah, there's a pump station on, um, oh, just to describe it, if you know where the, the, the Berlin Veterinary Clinic is right mm -hmm. across the street, um, it's a little station. It's, it's quite deep, but um, we can't carry all the, the wastewater from that, that section of Berry Street uh, by gravity. Uh, so it actually has to flow back to that pump station and then is pumped back. That's why there's a gravity line under the railroad track and then a force main go in the other direction. Um, those, those utilities will be, um, we will upgrade those um, through this rail project. Um, again, with our crystal ball thinking what our, what our future needs would be for, for development of that area. Uh, Donna. Um, I just wanna make sure I understood Tom that this money is coming from the utility fund sort of being redirected to do this now instead of other things or versus yeah, there is a utility reserve fund um looks, looks like we lost kurt so i hope i get this right kurt but um the enterprise funds has a uh, uh, reserve for this type of, of work of uh, utility work and and as i said we had a 50-year plan so we're expending some of those funds like Clarendon Avenue and other utility work that we're doing. We have uh, projects identified um, every year for foreseeable future. So we'll have to tap into that with the existing rates that we already have set monthly, or it's not the general fund, it is the, uh, those enterprise funds that will pay for this. So we're so doing Bill, projects Bill? out of order, so to speak. Okay, so Bill, would we be authorizing tonight to spend this, or this is just an information of, oh, this well, is how we, you're going to be spending I mean, it. We have to do it. So whether, whether we authorize it or not, but I mean, essentially, where the real thing you're doing is closing the street. I mean, you're, you're, you're authorizing the street closure for this work, but because of all the other implications, we felt it's important to brief you on everything. And to answer your your question, you know, more briefly, I mean, yes, this is money that we're spending on this now that we would have spent at some point, but we probably would have spent it on something else right now. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Any further questions from council? Any comments from the public since this is a public hearing? Uh, yes, I see a hand from Charlie. Go ahead. Uh, you're gonna want to unmute yourself, though. Crap! I have a couple of questions, and I don't know if they're to Tom or to Bill. But my question is: uh, Tom keeps talking about the right of way. Was there a right of way, rail right of way, from the I'll call it the brewery? 
over across Berry Street onto the portion of the right of way, rail right of way that was there during the Pioneer Street um, bridge decision 20 years ago. Yes, uh, the this portion of the of the track was um, there are three rails in, in the Montpelier area is Montpelier Chelsea, Montpelier Wells River, and I think the other was Montpelier Barry Railroad. Uh, there are actually three crossings at one time on Granite Street. You see one, only one there today. Um, Stonecutters Way, if you go back, um, give you a little history. Stonecutters Way, there are three active rails lines there. Um, Montpelier was able to uh, consolidate that to a single rail line. But the right of ways still exist, uh, they don't go away. So the Montpelier and Wells River railroad is the line that they are reactivating and what the yeah. court found is that they did not abandon it they they kind of cannibalized the the steel the, the rail lines and moved it to another track they discontinued use we were we were instructed to treat it as an active rail um, our bike path design was was um, built with uh, with instructions from the attorney general to, to treat it as an active rail. So the, the right of way still existed and that was finally settled after a lot of challenges that the state or the rail abandoned it um, was finally settled with the Pioneer Bridge project because you may recall that the Pioneer Bridge um, is a curved, has a curved approach. Um, prior to the construction, it was a kind of a right angle and it relocated that rail right of way and put it up on the hill where, where that right of way is today. So it begs the question, when the state bought the Washington County Railroad back in the early 80s, did it buy the land and, and or the property that that right of way is on? And if not, who owns it, if you know? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely know. I'm familiar with the 80s uh, acquisition by the state it was actually a court decision um, and we do have the decision in our in our office because um, I'm not there. Um, I want to check to see if it did include the Montpelier and Wells. Uh, they say it does. I haven't seen it though in that court decision. I didn't think it did, um, but I so I don't know the answer to that. If it was if it came in the court decision when the state actually took ownership of the right of way. So the the state actually leases the rail to Vermont Rail. Um, and pays the, the rail to operate. Yeah, I know that, but the question is who owns the land that the council is currently being asked to close the street on? You say it's a right of way from the Wells River line, but who owns that line? And who owns the property? And therefore, who owns the right of way? And I would think, I would think, notwithstanding Tom, what you just said, that before the city council would have proceed, it ought to do its homework and pull out the title and find out who owns the land. Um, I can go by what the attorney general, John Dunleavy tells us and that the state actually owns the land, so. Um, I and think that just, work was done by the Zorzi family, the Zorzi Asia family through years and years of litigation. Um, and uh, Charlie, just for the record, would you um, also uh, state your last name and what town you're, you're from? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, last name is Dickerson. I'm, okay. from, the, I'm from the city of Montpelier. Okay, great, uh, thank you so much. Used to be in District 3, but somebody moved me. Um, so, okay, so. Um, I'm uh, just kind of curious because the part that bothers me as a citizen goes back to something Bill said earlier. The city apparently was unaware of this project when it started. Now, not only is that rude, but I think the state has an obligation to coordinate with municipalities if it's going to start construction. And at the very least, I, and I appreciate Tom that John Dunleavy, who does work in the attorney general's office, and is assigned to transportation, made probably that comment or that uh, 
his uh, observation back 20, 30 years ago. But I think it's worth doing a little bit more homework. And my other question is, the, the portion of Berry Street that's going to be used for the quote unquote rail, has that rail line been surveyed and does the state have a copy of the survey in its file? And if not, why not? Um, I believe the, uh, the, the rail line is being resurveyed I think for the third time since I've been here by the, by the state. Um, it was done by the bike path engineer, then by, I forget the name of the surveyor for Agency of Transportation, and now um, Vermont uh, Survey and Engineering has uh, been um, tasked with uh, resurveying it again. I, I'm not sure why, but we've been feeding them all of our records and helping with that effort. So, yeah. um, so as you imagine, a, a rail line laid out in the uh, Late 1800s. Um, it's kind of difficult to follow. They use um, they use um, you know bearings and distances that don't really match a lot of things. They use um, rail center lines, so it, it's it's not it's not real easy to survey. So they 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 have a survey. They're they're redoing it to check it. Again. Okay. I don't know why. All right. Well, thank you and. Um... So anyone else have uh, comments or questions about um, this? I think John, I don't have his last name. Um, John, are no. you raising your hand? No, okay. Sorry, I, no ma'am, sorry, I'm, I'm the bad guy at the, at the auction. I just bought the Okay. Cattle. Sorry about no that. Worries. No Thank worries. Thank you. Okay, anyone else then? And by the way, Charlie, your point is well taken. Um, you. you know, we wish that we I had had more notice for sure. We need to do some homework. Okay, so uh, any other Got comments? <laughs> okay, all right, so I'm gonna close, and Cameron, you're not seeing anyone else, right? I am. Okay, so I'm gonna close the public hearing on this. Um, we have a, a proposal here. Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, Jack. I move that we approve the proposal to I move we approve, approve the proposal to close uh, Barry Street through traffic as uh, proposed in the uh, Department of Public Works memorandum for the time uh, set forth starting on May 20th and going for seven consecutive days or longer if necessary. Said July. July 20th? Mm -hmm. I thought Jack said May. Oh, I, I meant to say July if I didn't. Okay. A second. Uh, okay, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Aye. Okay. Uh, all right, so we, uh, so the motion uh, passes. Um, and so that, and we don't need to do any roll call because it was not unanimous, right? We're still just a part of the record, right? It was not, if it's not unanimous, you should probably do a roll call. Yeah, if it's not unanimous, you need to do a roll call. Okay. okay. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go in the uh, order that I, that you appear on my screen. Uh, so for, for me, that is uh, Dan. Nay. Jack. Aye. Lauren. Aye. Connor. Aye. Donna. Aye. And Jay. Aye. Okay, so I believe the eyes um, have it. The so the motion passes, and um, so we are going to move on. So um, the next uh, item is uh, the uh, proposed uh, street closure for State Street for um, a justice for all, uh, or I'm sorry, liberty and justice for all uh, mural. Um, so for this, just to explain how this item is going to go, um, I uh, assume John, who has his uh, 
uh, video on that that's, uh, are you John Clark? Yes, okay, great. Um, and I think I saw Eric uh, uh, Reddick on as well. I don't know if um, either of you would like to um, speak, but we'll, um, so what the way we're gonna, we're gonna do this is um, we'll hear from either of you or both of you. And then um, uh, I've got a, a, just a clarifying background uh, comment to make. And then we will hear from the public and, uh, and then we, as the council, will have our discussion. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, so that's just, just to frame it up here. And uh, so either uh, John or uh, Erica, would you like to um, uh, tell us about this proposal? Go ahead, John. That would be me. Sorry, I thought you would unmute me. Now I can buy the cow. Um, Erica, good evening, everyone. John Clar, how are you? John Clar uh, from Brookfield, Vermont, clar2020.com. Erica, I don't believe will be speaking, though she is a candidate uh, who's part of my group. Alice Flanders, I believe, is still on, and she had jumped in earlier, uh, jumping the gun a little. She's uh, got a lot of vim and vigor. So she, she may, uh, I, I, I'm hoping we'll be able, be able to speak briefly. As you all know, this was um, an application we put in rather short notice before the 4th of July celebration. This was ancillary to an event that I had been asked to speak at, um, celebrating the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and other documents, and in which I did specifically address many citizens' concerns about the legislature and the state uh, government taking steps that compromise certain constitutional rights. Uh, this this uh, application was denied either through this board or administratively. It didn't, I don't know that it was acted upon as a group. Um, and so we refiled. So um, the application explains its intent. Uh, there should be no need to defend the flag or the Pledge of Allegiance or our police officers who we also were celebrating, the good police officers that we rely upon. Uh, procedurally, I'd like to point out that now that July 4th has passed, uh, this council, if it wishes to delay our event until after the BLM project is complete, uh, that's certainly within your, uh, uh, your discretion and uh, you know, time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, our urgency originally in filing was for 4th of July. Uh, but we shouldn't be deprived uh, or restricted from our celebration of our Constitution um, because you know our heritage is very important for many of us, and we shouldn't be restricted because a public space was preempted by a social or political movement of any variety. Um, but now I, I would like to point out, because it's clearly got a lot of public attention here, but a city councilor has weighed in on this rather recklessly and maligned my intentions and those of the other people who are behind this application. And it's very concerning because that's rather, rather inflammatory to impose uh, a toxic invective on my motives and my credentials and my abilities. I don't really care about my campaign, but I have a lot of people running with me. And uh, we really don't need to be inflaming the conflict over race in Vermont, especially, but anywhere uh, by imputing motives to people that you have no business as a, as a public servant to do. It's really a violation. So I hope he's not stoking conflict on purpose. This is our state capital. You guys know that, I'm sure. Uh, and so even though I'm out of town, it is, it is the state capital and the uh, the symbol of our laws and our rules. Uh, but Connor Casey has actually said uh, that this application is an act of white fragility. Um, I submit that he should recuse himself from consideration of this hearing at this hearing since he's already indicated how he's going to vote. It's self a ra rather blatant violation of due process and we are entitled to that even though this is a privilege. Um, constitutionally, a public entity is prohibited from favoring one political ethnic or social group over others, uh, it's called the content neutrality principle. And whether in law or as applied, it does apply to this situation. Uh, this has been utterly disregarded by Mr. Casey. He did me and my people a favor uh, by showing his blatant ballot uh, bias. Uh, there are many Vermonters who, who wished and continue to wish to celebrate our liberty and our historical documents. 
there is a general complaint by many against our government's overreach, as I explained again in my uh, speech on Saturday. So I speak for a lot of Vermonters in trying to secure our constitution as the middle ground between perhaps different perspectives on how to proceed to solve a problem that we all agree needs to be addressed. No one is supporting police brutality. No one wishes to see people impoverished or compromised or oppressed because of their race. Uh, but I also speak for about, as I say, 30 2020 candidates uh, for state office. And they have joined me and are running on a specific policy list, uh, which includes holding government accountable, not only with money, as you folks are talking about tonight, but also with our rights and our constitution. And I expect that all of those candidates support this application. But since white people like Connor Casey tell white people like me that my words must be dismissed because of my white skin, I have invited just one of our many fine candidates, uh, Alice Flanders, to briefly address as a person of color the motive behind this application, which she is a party to, and why it must be approved. You really have to approve it because you have to maintain content neutrality. So that would be my submission. In summary, I again uh, ask the, the council to uh, perhaps reread the original application. And I'm hoping that Alice might speak briefly because she also has some information to share about this day. Um, Alice Flanders, I hope you're still with us. Um, so I think uh, probably the um, probably the appropriate thing to have happen would be to have Alice speak as a part of the public. I mean, unless um, unless she's a, sort of a part of your presentation, which I mean, I suppose she could be. Well, she is, as I specifically referenced, I think she has a very um, strong voice and she is a candidate. And John Flower, governor, really is a collective, will actually be announcing a, a number of new candidates on the 16th at the State House. Uh, a lot of people running behind three policy issues. And she's been uh, along with our team since day one. So she, I think, is well qualified as a veteran and as a person of color to, uh, to counter the potential toxicity planted in the public by open public comments uh, maligning me and this motive here, I think that her testimony is particularly cogent to undo the potential to cause more friction rather than comedy and reconciliation. So I, I, I hope she's still there, but I would, I would love to hear what she has. And I think also the council may want to hear something she found research. She's still with us. Okay. All right, Alice, Hi. if you are here, oh, you've unmuted yourself. Great. Go ahead, Alice. I unmuted myself, but can you see my wonderful face? No. Oh, too bad. All in glamorous, glorious color. Uh, I am a person of color uh, that has never or hardly ever played any part in my professional, certainly never in my professional uh, career and uh, even in uh, business or uh, personal issues, it's never really come up as uh, being important. You should understand, first of all, that I'm not new to uh, the concept of having uh, been a person who may have been part of a group that was uh, not allowed uh, certain liberties, and then later uh, given that free opportunity. I grew up during the time, and I remember the time when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. He wore, uh, he, on his assassination time, I remember people like this uh, Black Lives Matter. And look, I'm just, can I be honest with you? I, want, I don't want anybody to say anything. I just want you to nod your head if you want to hear the perspective of this grandmother. Just nod your head. I'm not going to be long. Can, you, can I be honest? Absolutely. Or do I have to tell the party line? All right. Well, and I will honestly tell you, I'm a 65-year-old grandmother, even though I don't even look like I'm that old. Believe me, I keep healthy. But I was around when integration became the law of the land in this country. I was around when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I have been well read and I have I was part of the the forefront when I was allowed 
at the at great cost to my parents to enter me into government uh, into a non-government school, private schools, all girls schools, and I had to work, as they say, twice as hard to get the same grade because look in math, if it's not all right, you can mark it all wrong. Even if most of the people get partial credit, I got none. Well, no problem. I was motivated to work a little bit harder till I got them all right. And you can't argue with that. But that only made me stronger. And you know, when the girls I went to school with found that I was a viable candidate for their math team as a sophomore, they appointed me the captain of the junior math team. And I was the only person of color there. The, and, it, and these girls came from traditional families that were not black, I promise you. And then uh, continuing with that same um, spirit, uh, because I am very competitive, in my junior year, I was appointed captain of the senior math team. And all of the girls, we won. We beat those guys, we beat those girls, we beat everybody. And I had a number of things, including going to a university. I eventually became a physics major turned math major. I was accepted at an MIT Lincoln lab work study, worked in a group that had just launched two communication satellites. I had to prove that I had the capability of doing the work as part of that Lincoln lab, uh, MIT Lincoln lab group. The guy explained to me some poly, you know, cyclotomic polynomials, said, you know, programming. Yep, I've had basic and Fortran and some assembly language. And if you want, um, that's, I can show you. He said, well, I'd like you to write a program. Within the week, I came back with the program to generate the coefficients of the cyclotomic polynomials that was explained to me in concept. And if I hadn't been able to do that, then I probably would have been made part of the clerical staff uh, during that program when I was there. But I was capable. And you know, once people understood that I did have that capability, the doors were wide open. Why would you, why wouldn't you? If you have, and later I joined the military after I, after I had competed successfully and studied for a year. As a physics student, I studied in France under a scholarship at a prestigious university, uh, Montpellier University, where only perhaps 12% of those who matriculate from their uh, secondary education in France have the privilege of going on to further studies unlike a lot of kids here who think that everybody has the right to go to college at the expense of the taxpayers. The French did not look at it that way. You had to demonstrate that you could contribute to the national effort to make it worth the taxpayers' effort to pay for you, not for your party. And later I joined the military. I was able, I was successfully able to compete or at least to join uh, the, the group that had, they had just started Navy Space and I was a space systems engineering and space systems operations student at the graduate level. But I promise you, if I had not been capable of working with my group that was designing the deployment of the antenna on, the, on a satellite in that group where I was working, I wouldn't have been there. I would say that such groups. Now, given that, and also my father, by the way, was a freedom rider before he married. He was one of, he put his life on the line and he went in and helped people in Mississippi earn their right to, uh, to register to vote. I see, a, a, I don't want to say, I'm not saying white privilege because I have been on both sides, believe it or not. And the, the ceiling was and is broken. I have been to the wonder, I have, I'm, I have been to here in Vermont to the um, Constitution House uh, where it says Constitution House and there's a, I should say, if I could send you an email, Anne, and you could send it to everybody else. But very quickly, I'll tell you, it's a marquee there at the Constitution House here in Vermont, 
that says Windsor settled 1764 became the political center of the upper, uh, upper Connecticut River Valley. Here, the constitution of the free and independent state of Vermont was, adapt uh, was adopted at the Tavern of Elijah West on July 8th, 1777. Today is the birthday of the, of the free and independent state of Vermont constitution. Happy birthday to you. Okay, it was adopted at the Tavern of, uh, of Elijah West on July 8, 1777. This constitution was the first to prohibit slavery and establish universal manhood suffrage. Vermont was an independent republic until 1791 when it was admitted into the union as the 14th state. I don't believe as a military officer in solving problems that are already fixed. I don't believe in fixing problems that are not broken. We here in the state of Vermont do not have a problem. I wanted to, I'm telling you honestly, look, you're not looking at my face, but I'm looking at yours. And I want to take off our masks of red and blue. Because when you are in that position where you are right now, you're representing all of us. If you're not, please step down. Okay, so here we are. Here we are, dear people. Black lives matter. I'm not saying they don't, but I'm telling you that all lives matter. Now I know that that's anathema to some people, but if you could see a picture of my wonderful family, because you know what? I did believe what Dr. Martin Luther King said, take a deep breath and swallow hard. I want you to know that when I went to MIT Lincoln Lab, I met a young man from Vermont. His name was Jeffrey Flanders. His father was James Hartness Flanders, who was, an, was a, MIT engineering graduate, graduate level graduate. He became, and he was the chairman of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics when he died. That was my father-in-law. Jeff's grandfather was Senator Ralph Flanders of Vermont. You may not know your history, but I'm going to, I'm going to teach you a little bit right now. When McCarthy stood up and was bullying everybody into a particular perspective, that brave Vermonter, that brave Vermonter was not afraid to stand up respectfully, but very clearly articulate what the problems were as he saw it. And you know, McCarthyism came to an end because of that lone, that first step of the lone writer, that man. Jeff's great-grandfather was Governor James Hartness. Springfield, Vermont has um, a, a, a telescope, the Hartness House Telescope, if you all don't know it, because in addition to being governor, he was also an avid um, scientist and engineer. Look, people, I met Jeff when I was, after my first year as a physics student, when I was accepted to MIT Lincoln Lab. It took me five years to, to, to okay, so I will. And we got married. We have a daughter. We have grandchildren. If you were to look at my grandchildren, I don't know, my first two oldest have red hair and their eyes and their fair skin because our daughter married a Brit. And you couldn't, and, and Jake is, it freckles and burns very readily. I believed Dr. Martin Luther King. Are you all gonna tell me that he lied? to have such a dream that someday he would be judged by the content of his character and not by the color of his skin. I 
am suspicious of Black Lives Matter. I'm going on the record to tell you so. I'm telling you because I have been there and you have not. I have been there. And you know what? For all these years that people have judged me as an engineer, as a mathematician, just based on my personal and my professional qualifications. Now, when you look at me, you dare not overlook the fact that my skin has a lot of melanin. We are stepping backwards. Am I saying black lives don't matter? No, but you wanna know something? I have seen the academic scores of our young people here in Vermont. And I know COVID is going to put a good cover on all of this, but it doesn't override what's happened in the last few years. And our academic scores have been below the national average. And yet, with all of that, we have time and we have resources to perpetrate upon our population, the next generation of Vermont citizens, our resources. We have time and money and resources to tell them about how Black Lives Matter, we're taking a step back, people. So I want you to hold up to liberty and justice for all. Can we all say that we can at least stand to that? Why do we have to genuflect in order to say it? I do not, I suspect Black Lives Matter because if you, you look at where the money goes, if you donate there, okay, because I was the money guy at the Pentagon, I managed about a billion dollars a year and I was especially good at it. So Alice, I'm gonna interrupt you here real quick. It's um, been about and, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, and do you understand what I've been saying though? Oh yeah, and, no, and, but if you have any like just final like thoughts. My, okay, just, my final yeah, thoughts are this. You can go ahead and preferentially approve of Black Lives Matter and then turn your back on liberty and justice for all, but history will judge it. I want you to stand and support. Connor, I want you to say, all right, John, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Liberty and justice for all, of course I'm for that. Black lives matter, brown lives matter, pink and purple polka dot lives matter too. My chicken's lives matter. But yes, liberty and justice for all, we Vermonters can all rally behind that. I wanna stand with you. I want you to stand with me. Can we put it into it there? Sounds great. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. I'm going to put myself back on mute. Okay. Just to, so I won't be attempted to say something more. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Um, all right. So um, I am going to um, take a step back and share something that um, our lawyers shared with us. Uh, today, actually, uh, just to give us a little bit of context and some clarity around um, some of the questions that have actually already been, um, that have come up. Um, and then uh, we're gonna open it up to the public. And, and um, I'm, so because Alice was a, a part of uh, the presentation, we gave um, her some additional time, but uh, for other folks who speak, just a reminder, please try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. And, um, and actually, um, uh, at some point, uh, we should get uh, Alice's last name and what town she lives in. Um, well, we can do that probably later. Um, Bill, that wasn't a hand, was it? No, I thought I saw a hand. No. Okay, just checking. <clears throat> okay, so last name was Flanders. Oh, Flanders, that's right. Yes, yes, she said that. Thank you. Uh, great. All right, so. Um, so we sort of anticipated that there'd be a question about whether or not the city was obligated to approve the request, um, uh, you know, either uh, sort of as a, as a street closure or based on the content. Um, but mostly folks, uh, I think there's this, um, actually what I would call a misunderstanding uh, floating around that we are obligated to approve this uh, based on the First Amendment. Um, and 
the reason I can say that is because so we got clarity from our uh, lawyer uh, earlier today, and I just want to um, just um, read part of the the excerpt from our lawyer just to, so that everybody has the same information. Um, so it's going to take me a little bit to read it here, but I think it's probably worth doing. <clears throat> so um, underlying the potential First Amendment argument is the notion that the street is a public forum, which the city has opened up for private citizens to convey their messages to the world. In the context of a public forum, for example, when the city allows climate change activists to protest on uh, in, in a city park, the First Amendment generally requires the city to give equal opportunity to all who want to use that public forum to voice their own message. Uh, the city must give citizens uh, of all viewpoints their time on the, the public soapbox, regardless of whether the city agrees with the citizens' viewpoints. In these examples, um, and I, I skipped a couple of um, cases, but uh, there were some uh, cases cited. Um, in these, uh, in these examples, it is clear who is speaking. A private citizen is holding a sign or audibly chanting. They just happen to be standing on government property. Generally, in such cases, the government can, within reason, restrict the time, place, and manner of protests, demonstrations, or other expressive content, uh, conduct. Uh, but the government cannot deny a request to speak or demonstrate in the public forum based on the content or viewpoint of the requester's message. In other words, the government cannot give preferential treatment to certain points of view in certain uh, citizens over, or, or certain citizens over others. The display of a mural, monument, or other expressive symbol on government property is legally different unless circumstances clearly indicate that such displays reflect solely the viewpoint of a private citizen, courts typically consider these displays to be government speech. The US Supreme Court has explained, when government speaks, it is not barred by the free speech clause from determining the content of what it says. That freedom in part reflects the fact that it is the democratic electoral process that first and foremost provides a check on government speech. Thus, government statements and government actions and programs that take the form of speech do not normally trigger the First Amendment rules designed to protect the marketplace of ideas. Instead, the free speech clause helps produce informed opinions among members of the public who are then able to influence the choices of a government that through, through words and deeds will reflect its electoral mandate. So I hope that that um, just sheds some light for folks on what we are obligated to do or not, but uh, the question still remains what, what we will do. Um, so at this point, um, I would uh, open up the floor to uh, public comment. So um, is there, um, I'd just love to get a, a cue here of folks who would like to comment. Uh, Cameron. I have, um... Maggie Prince has raised her hand, and then we had um, Tracy Canino, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering y'all's names, I'm just saying it uh, phonetically, um, had asked us to speak um, via email, and I saw that she was on the line. Okay, so those are the yeah, two right so now. far? And yep. then I saw, uh, John, you have uh, something that you would like to say as well? Uh, so I may, I may go, uh, John, like uh, just very brief, just brief. sure, yeah. sure. I'll, I'll, Sorry. I'll, I'll have you go first and then we'll go, um, Maggie and then Tracy and there's no one else so far yet. Uh, Cameron, is that right? No. Yeah, and I so saw someone, I saw someone uh, named Connor, not Connor Casey came on and looked like they were waving their hand yes. too. They just oh. raised their hand. So we have Connor as well. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, John, go ahead. So as an attorney who's worked in free speech law for years, I would just uh, point out that I would rather not have litigation on the matter because I think we all would rather not have that. Um, whatever you've just read from your attorneys, you clearly do have the power also to grant this. And it's a gray area about what's a mural and other forms of speech. This is core political speech. So if you, what you've done though, what you've just read to me, is an opinion of counsel that was solicited for the specific purpose of finding legal grounds to deny this application, which I would say also shows a bias, but moreover, 
in the very words you read it said, um, undermining the free speech argument. So I, I would hope that this council would not be out to undermine our free speech argument, but to embrace our free speech argument, especially when what's in the balance is something as uh, highly visible as the US flag and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and our police. So I, you know, legally, I don't agree with your council. I don't really wanna fight it out in court. I just wanna have the opportunity uh, when Black Lives Matter is done to display our nation's heritage in a proud way to affirm it for all of us as the middle road. But anyway, thanks. That's, uh, I appreciate you allowing me to just add that for the record. Thank you. If, uh, Bill, I, go ahead. Yep, if I may, because um, we did talk earlier or there was talk earlier about not imputing people's intentions. Um, the city council did not ask for an opinion, I did. Um, and this, the question was specifically asked, are there any legal barriers to them approving or denying the question that was not asked, um, find a way to deny it. So I just would appreciate, uh, you made a good point about not presupposing other people's intentions and, uh, um, and I think maybe you just did that on my behalf, so. Well, Ed, just to be clear okay. though, there was nothing in the opinion to suggest any reason why, the, why you would not be able to deny it. So it's one-sided whether or not that's what you specifically solicited, forgive me, to uh, impugn that, but, it, but that's what it looks like. And that's part well, of the record. If, so, if we were required to, if we were required to approve it, it would have said that. And so you're saying, here's the argument for why you might approve it. Here's the argument for why you don't. I can. I'd be happy to send you the full opinion. Yeah, I, and I did not read the whole thing. Right. Well, so. I'll have courts, yeah. and we'll have courts look at it if they're if the lawyers are wrong. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. So I'm I'm just saying there are different views, and it's not that clear. It's a big area of law. But okay. so thank you. Thank you. So. Yeah. I don't mean to impugn your integrity, Bill. Okay, uh, Maggie. Go on video for this. Hi guys, Maggie Lenz, I'm a District 1 resident. Um, I really um, wanna keep this short. Um, I hope that we're all going to stop suspending disbelief and pretend that this is anything from Mr. Carr other than a really political move. I think it's clear to all of us that that's what this is. This is a struggling campaign that's trying to get attention. Um, I don't think that he needs any assistance by Mr. King. I'm doing that um, myself. This is um, the time for the Black Lives Matter movement. I appreciate so well and that the council did on this as a Montpelier resident. That sign is extremely important. That's a reminder of the work to do. Um, Alice, thank you so much for your point of view. I certainly can't speak from personal experience and disagree with your experience. I'm glad you have that experience here. But I do have a number of friends of color that have not had that same experience here. And I think just by virtue of being from the United States, we have a lot of work to do. Um, to write um, any message, um, to add an addendum to the Black Lives Matter mural will dilute the message and will take away from the work that we need. It's been pointed out to the council numerous times, this isn't a stand-in for real meaningful work, but it is a reminder and it's important. I'm begging you to please uh, deny this application. Don't dilute this message for a political stunt. Thank you for all your work. Um, Tracy. Yes, we can hear you, but it's a little tough to hear you. Uh, say a little bit more. Hi, uh, just one, one. Uh, uh, just Tracy, I'm so sorry. It's very hard to hear y'all. If you turn your um, camera off, it's sometimes easier to hear the audio. It improves the connection. Better? A little bit. A little bit. Um, okay. okay. Okay, just go wonder, for it. I wonder if she's live streaming. If if you're live streaming the meeting, we had this problem earlier on. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you may want to, like if you're watching it in a different window or something, you may want to close that. Or she may want to call us. Yeah. No. No. That's about the same. But yeah, go. I mean, if you want to go for it, we will do our best to, to hear you. Hey, hey, 
Um, Tracy, I'm actually going to interrupt you. I, I think it might make, uh, may, maybe you can um, call in on a, a cell phone or so. Um, what do you think about that? Number. Hold on and I will read it to you. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Two seconds. Okay, so the number is area code 929-205-6099. And then they're gonna ask you for a meeting ID. Oops, sorry, y'all. Um, the meeting ID is 928-3586-0010. And if it asks you for a password, it's 090953. So, yeah, Did you get that, Cameron? I cannot figure out which number you're asking me to repeat. That a number. Is it a two, two or a zero? zero? Two or zero. I'm not sure. It starts, starts out. out. It starts, it starts out. out. Uh, nine, nine, two, nine. Nine. Okay, I got you. And then more than one it's nine two nine two, two, two. Okay, okay. Okay. That's all okay. okay. Hey, great. Sorry, guys. We're, we're all getting through this together. Very much. Um, and so we're gonna uh, skip to Connor. And then um, hopefully Tracy will be back on the line with us and we can um, uh, hear from them um, next. Uh, Connor, uh, go ahead. Thank you all. Uh, Connor Kennedy of the Montpelier. Um, as much as there's been a, quite a few things that have been said tonight that I would love to dissect and uh, understand the actual factual nature of some of the comments. I'm going to leave it to the issue at hand, which is the uh, matter of whether or not liberty and justice for all should be placed in front of the state house. I think the premise on why it should be there is problematic in itself, in that when that was first stated, it was all white men that decided that it was liberty and justice for all. It was clearly not a diverse group of individuals that were making that decision. We've seen throughout our history that people have been disproportionately affected by those that have created it. I think we have a great country. I agree with Mr. Clark that you know we should celebrate this, but we also have to understand that it is not equally great for every individual in this country. Uh, I like to equate it. I saw this uh, in a video. If someone's house is on fire, this is what Black Lives Matter is saying, and then you say, well, what about my house? That's the all lives or liberty and justice for all fire. You're trying to make the fact that someone's house on fire is not important in that moment. Everyone's life might be important, but in this moment, there is a huge need to support these individuals that are crying for help. They've been crying for help for centuries. And if we take this moment to try to paint over, literally paint over this important message, I just think it's incredibly problematic. Uh, I would um, encourage people to look at the public messages and commentaries that are out there from Mr. Clark. I think it speaks for themselves. I have a hard time believing that this is genuine on its face. Um, I think we all uh, can appreciate that this is a, country that we wish to be great, but in this moment, it is certainly not great for every US citizen. I, uh, I understand that one of the speakers said that she feels that they have had a great life here. I've had friends that are people of color that have moved from the state because of the interactions that they've had here. And it is just so unfortunate. I know we like to think that we are this great progressive place, but we have so much work to do in the state across the country. And I think it would be a, a terrible disservice to try to literally bracket the message of Black Lives Matter with this other message. Uh, 
it, it just seems so incredibly uh, disingenuous in this time. Um, the one thing I will say, I saw before um, to the uh, Mr. Carr that proposed this about his character being attacked. Um, you are running for public officer. I, I've ran for public office myself. I hope you're ready for it because it does not stop. Um, you have to stand behind the messages that you put out there. So uh, thank you for your time. I hope that you do not support this proposal. It's incredibly disingenuous and we need to do focus our work on the issue at hand, which is making sure Vermont in this country has equal access for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just checking in, uh, Tracy, and I didn't see the, the other person's name, but um, Tracy, are you on? I didn't see a new phone number, but I also just emailed her. Um, okay. So while we're waiting, we did have another um, uh, person raise their hand, um, Peg Walls. Uh, sorry, Hi, that, can you hear me? Yes. Um, sorry, is this this is Meg? Yes. Okay, go go for it, Meg. Also, My name is Meg also, Walls. Yeah, and say where you're from. And I'm from Montpelier. Oh, I yeah. can't remember my district number. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm going to keep this very brief. I I echo everything that Maggie and Connor said before, and I am opposed to this proposal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yes. yes, and we can hear you oh, well, cool. even. Okay, go ah, ahead. <laughs> technology. <laughs> uh, yes, so I'm, I'm also here. Uh, we're in District 1. Um, uh, Tracy Camino, Scott Robertson, and Adam Robertson is also here with me. So there's three of us in the household. Um, and I just wanted to say that I, I agree with the, the other uh, Montpelier citizens uh, who've spoken this evening. Um, it's not that there can be that much disagreement about the wonderful phrase, um, equality, you know, uh, justice for all, but that the timing of this is very inappropriate. We need to sit with the uncomfortableness that we have with the Black Lives Matter uh, saying that is in our city, um, because that is what we need to be reflecting on right now so that we can work upon ourselves and improve ourselves um, and so that we can move forward with trying to find the equity and the equality that that needs to be there. Um, and that the timing of trying to add something to that would be, would be to dilute, dilute the message that is already there. Not that it can't be there, uh, it, at some point, and not that it shouldn't be there at some point, but it, it's exceptionally unfortunate that people would feel so strongly to try to force that to be in the conversation at this point, to dilute the message that is already part of the conversation now that, that we need to do because we need to do the work, um, not just in saying that kind of a phrase, but in showing up for our neighbors and doing things in our community and, and changing our policies to make that happen. Um, and, you know, uh, Alice gave an exceptionally impassioned speech. She's such a wonderful speaker. Um, and she has so many great qualifications. And certainly I, I don't have any of that. But I, I do feel very strongly that I think that, you know, even in my ordinariness, that you know we need to have the first conversation first um, before we, we dilute it and, and, and get back to this red, white, and blue uh, phrase for, from the Constitution 
uh, that perhaps is, it's not yet time to have that conversation because we're not there yet. And I'll stop yeah. once the same thing. Adam, Adam and Scott agree with that statement. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I have to say something at this point because the, the conversations that we're having right now, the, the topics seem to be, well, we have a, a pressing pressure problem on us and we have to address it. But you wanna know something? I'm 65 years old and I've been doing this for a while. Isn't it convenient that this comes up just around the time when we have elections? And isn't it convenient that when you donate money to Black Lives Matter, it goes to um, um, go blue or wherever that thing is. And no, it doesn't go to the DNC directly, but they contributed hundreds of thousands to uh, the uh, Democratic candidates. Isn't it convenient that for decades that there's there have been there's been violence in black communities across the country and yet nobody speaks about that what about the little eight-year-old girl who was shot in the back of her, her uh, mother's car what about the six-year-old girl whose father was shot nobody's talking about that because it does not fit the narrative now i want you to know i don't think we have a problem here in vermont and i'm not saying that your friends your friend, I'm not even saying the token friends, because I lived my life. And I have been working very hard in support of uh, issues of equality for all people. All of my students have always felt they'd get a fair shake from Mrs. Flanders, black, white, or grizzly gray. But isn't it just convenient that it comes up at the time of elections more than at other times? And isn't it so disappointing that these issues that I did mention never get any space in the uh, in the media. Thank you, um, Cameron. Do we have anyone else um, in the queue? Um, Erica Reddick has raised her hand. Okay, uh, Erica, are you ready to go? I am, thank you, and I apologize. My video will not turn on. I'm not sure what my technical difficulty is, so I apologize. Okay. Um, and I just want to say, I understand for the record, I am not a Montpelier resident, and so I understand that my uh, perspective does not have as much weight. Um, but the reason I support John's- Sorry, before you get, uh, get into it, um, where do you live? I, oh, yes, I live in Burlington. I'm a resident okay, of Burlington. Thank yes, you. Thank All you. right, go ahead. Um, uh, the reason that my husband and I support this, um, this mural proposal is because we are in an interracial couple, uh, or we are in, a, in an interracial marriage. And so we've had these conversations. We've been having these conversations about racial reconciliation and what that looks like and what's required for many, many years. Um, and so we're very glad that the Black Lives Matter movement has highlighted areas where um, Black people have legitimate grievances against certain systems, certain cities, um, certain people. Uh, he's a filmmaker, so we understand he's we've dealt with discrimination issues as a dark-skinned black man with him getting um you know the roles for a couple of years all he got from his agent were thug number one drug dealer number two and stuff like that and that's and that's so so we know very personally what it looks like to be championing these causes and moving the black uh, movements or pushing black excellence moving forward. We work with at-risk youth. We donate our time and our energy. We are also very proud Americans who believe very much in the founding promise that all men are created equal. And while this country has not always lived up to its founding ideals, it has with every success successive generation done better and better and better. The United States is the story of progressive sanctification 
this is the greatest country on earth. And while we are not perfect, we are always looking to get better. And I love that. What concerns me is that the BLM messaging is very divisive. It is very, very divisive. And as an interracial couple and the things that we're dealing with and the way that people are talking is so, in many ways, very much profoundly missing the point of moving this country forward. And so it is in our opinion that with liberty and justice for all is not a response to the BLM. It's not in addition to, it's not trying to cover up. It is an affirmation that this country is created for everyone and that everyone has equal rights, equal justice, equal under the law. And so I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, anyone else? Um, I do not see anyone. Now would be the time to throw up a um, blue hand or an emoji or a physical wave. Okay. All right, so I'm not um, seeing anyone else either. Um, so I have, I have my own thoughts, but I'm sure you all do as well. Um, so I'm happy to have other folks start if you would like, or I'll jump in. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Well, I, uh, I feel the need to respond a bit since my name was brought up by John Clark in the beginning. Um, and I'll say like a few weeks ago when we painted the Black Lives Matter mural, um, that was a beautiful day. We had 300 people come from all over the state, uh, new Americans, families, you know, everybody was adding and, and painting that mural. Um, and it was just a very basic affirmation of the values we hold. And it was a message to elected officials that, you know, when you drive down State Street, you know, please keep that in mind as you make policy. It was a message to us too. Um, it didn't say black lives are the best. It didn't say black lives are the only lives that matter. But the amount of angst this has caused with being vandalized within 24 hours of being painted, vandalized again a couple days later, um, just shows, I think, the need to paint it to begin with and how far we have to come. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against the concept of liberty and justice for all. I think it's a great aspirational statement, but right now it's a farce in America. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, maybe something to aspire to, but until we can recognize that black lives matter, um, I don't think liberty and justice for all is alive and well in America. So I apologize, Mr. Clark, if I um, am doubting your intentions with coming in here with this request, but I, I've read some of your commentary pieces and you know I find them offensive. Uh, commentary pieces called reverse racism, um, where you talk about um, black culture is rife with anti-white references and themes and this has been tolerated presumably because of white guilt. Um, you have other pieces where you say you're a victim because of your dark complexion. You've been a victim in Vermont because of this. You've questioned whether systemic racism even exists in Vermont. Um, and I think worst of all, you know, you have a bit of a history with us in Montpelier too, John. Uh, when the Black Lives Matter flag was flown, you wrote a commentary piece come out against it. Uh, using a quote from Audre Lorde, who I'm sure would love that you're using the quote at the end of this, uh, where you say, expecting a marginalized group to educate the oppressors is the con continuation of racist patriarchal thought. And then you add, by that measure, the schools that permitted the BLM flag assisted their black students to become Uncle Toms. Those students, John, were the same ones who graduated Montpelier High School who are the ones who organized this event in a beautiful organic display of unity. Um, and when I hear you say that, I don't want a drop of your paint going next to the mural that they worked on. You say we're trying to politicize this, but I don't think there's any center with racism. I'm not interested in meeting somebody in the center as a shown of unity if they don't believe black lives matter. 
And sure enough, I don't think all conservatives are racist either, John, but, but I definitely think you are. So I'll absolutely oppose this. I'll oppose this. This is government speech. Um, and I don't want to be a part of your political spun. And honestly, I've been on the record way too much already, giving you the press that you're desperately craving for. Um, and I, I, I think it's sad. I, I won't say any more. Um, that's it. You know where I stand? Thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you. Um, I've been struggling with this issue because when, uh, you know, I'm someone who for many years has considered myself a First Amendment freedom of speech absolutist. And I think there's a certain uh, appeal to the idea that uh, content, the, the rule of content neutral regulation should apply here. Um, and that is the uh, standard that Mr. Clark uh, brought before us in his, uh, his, in his remarks. However, I went beyond that to do, do some legal research. And in fact, the standard that uh, Mr. Clark stated is not the legal standard that applies to, uh, to this situation. And, uh, and the legal standard that I believe is the correct legal standard is the principle enunciated in Pleasant Grove versus Summum, uh, Supreme Court decision from 2009, which uh, says that in fact, if, uh, if a municipality uh, makes a decision to give over public property for uh, monuments, that uh, those that choice to dedicate that public property is a policy determination by the municipal government and it is uh, speech by the government. I think it's clear that uh, painting a mural on uh, on public streets is the same as erecting a monument in a city park in that uh, the uh, people who observe that uh, monument or the sign will uh, see it and conclude that it is not the opinion of whoever might have painted it there, but the opinion of the municipality. Um, it's also uh, painting a sign on the public street is different from allowing a march because as the Supreme Court pointed out, the march ends, the uh, leaflets uh, are given away and, and then they leave. Whereas the monument or the uh, painting on the public street endures as a statement of that uh, public uh, policy. So um, I've said many times in this council that I believe that we should listen to the uh, legal advice we received from our attorney. And I, I believe that today too. And I'm happy to see that the uh, legal advice we get from the attorney is the same advice that I would be giving, giving if I were uh, giving legal advice to the city. That leads me to the conclusion that we are not required to uh, provide uh, an opportunity for a different private organization to, uh, to paint their message to stand in contrast to the message of Black Lives Matter. And it's clear to me that although we, the resolution adopted by the, by the city council at our meeting was to close State Street for the purpose of allowing someone else to paint Black Lives Matter on the road. It's clear to me that when we took that action, we were expressing unanimously the view of the city council that we adopt a value of Black Lives Matter. So that's all going to is it permissible for us to uh, deny the application? And I would say that it clearly is. The next question then is, is it the, the right thing to do to deny the application? And I again think it is. Uh, 
contrary to what the speaker uh, said, the message of Black Lives Matter is not divisive. It is a principle that, that in my view, our city council, the great majority of the, of the residents of our city uh, and, uh, and most of the residents of the state, I think, uh, strongly, uh, strongly believe in. And uh, I think the person who's being uh, divisive, in fact, is Mr. Clark in his, uh, on his uh, campaign webpage, his commentary today uh, bears the headline, BLM versus the United States flag in Vermont Capitol. Um, I do not believe that uh, Black Lives Matter is challenging or standing up against the United States flag. I fly a United States flag uh, in front of my house, but, uh, but I oppose the message. I do not believe that uh, it is complementary to the Black Lives Matter message. I do not believe it's intended to be complementary to the Black Lives Matter message. And I also oppose the, uh, the request. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to start out by acknowledging that I have heard from no constituents who wanted this painting. I only heard from people in Montpelier who opposed it. Um, in the application, the Clark campaign claimed they were proposing this to create unity. And in fact, the entire reason we need to say Black Lives Matter in big, bold, yellow letters is because far too often we don't focus on Black lives in the state and in this country. And the message they're putting forward seems entirely aimed at distracting from and undermining the message Black Lives Matter. And it's using different words, but essentially conveys a all lives matter sentiment, which Alice confirmed earlier is a sentiment that they really wanted to get across through this project. And as Connor mentioned, you know, seeing the vandalism on Montpelier Street painting the very first night, uh, people have torn down a Black Lives Matter flag in another Vermont community recently. There's been vandal um, vandalizing happening in other Black Lives Matter street paintings across Vermont in the past few weeks. So seeing the reaction that this painting and this message is provoking, um, you know, it just really underscores how much work we have to do as a state to address systemic racism and the white supremacy on which our society is built. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that striving for liberty and justice for all is a great aspiration. Um, as a woman who wasn't part of that all men are created equal in our constitution, we have a lot of work to do in a lot of regards, but I think at this moment in our nation's history, the path in striving for liberty and justice for all demands that we affirm that Black Lives Matter. I believe we don't need to approve this. I strongly oppose it. I think it only serves to underscore the importance of the message Black Lives Matter. And I just wanna once again reiterate my appreciation for my fellow counselors and the community members who came together to approve the Black Lives Matter painting. Um, I think it was a great project. Um, and again, this whole conversation we're having tonight, I think just reminds us all how much work we have to do and how important that message is uh, to be putting out there um, in a big, bold, yellow message to our, uh, our community members. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so first I wanna say, um, that I very much believe in the statement, liberty and justice for all. I believe in the Pledge of Allegiance. I believe in the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence and our founding documents. And I, I would echo uh, Ms. Reddick's um, sentiment in large part that the United States has been a beacon uh, of hope in the world. And it is a wonderful country. I mean, and it is an exceptional one in many, many ways. Um, but that's not the issue that's before us. Um, the issue before us is a specific application to put that phrase that doesn't appear in the Constitution, but appears in the Pledge of Allegiance next to another statement um, that was painted 
uh, on that street already. And the question is one of context. Um, and I think it's important, you know, I agree with, with Jack. Uh, I did some research as well. I also believe, uh, agree with the city attorney's analysis. You know, if we are to believe in these documents, the constitution and the declaration of independence, then we have to believe that they have some meaning and, and that they don't warp to fit our own opinions. And in this case, the first amendment protects an open forum, but it doesn't protect government speech. It allows governments to speak um, as, as they wish, just as we pass resolutions for particular people. You know, if we pass a resolution praising Chief Fakos, we don't have to pass a resolution praising Bob Gowans, the fire department chief, uh, because he wants to be recognized. If we choose to paint hockey sticks on the street to recognize a team, uh, Norwich having a great victory. Um, we don't have to paint basketballs on the street because the basketball fans want equal representation. These are things that we get to do a as a government to express um, our, our voice our, uh, as a community. Um, and the constitution and the US Supreme Court do protect that. Um, or do not require um, equal time, uh, such as a public forum might have, such as often happens on the state house lawn, where competing uh, private views are aired openly and equally. So if Mr. Carr wants to have a rally on July 3rd, he can, but if somebody else wants to have a rally, Connor Casey wants to have a rally on July 4th, he can as well. And these expressions can be voiced. So if we look at this question as one of should we approve of this particular design in this particular place in this particular time, I don't think it's a close question. I think it is something that ultimately tries to bracket um, and mixes a number of different messages. Um, we have approve the Black Lives Matter, it has been installed. Um, and that is the, I think that is the statement. If we want liberty and justice for all, um, which I think there's general support for as a philosophic content um, in another area, you know, I think that might be a different question, but that's not the question before us either. It's a question of if Black Lives Matter is on the street and liberty and justice for all, does that detract from the Black Lives Matter statement that we've made? And I think it does. I, I think it causes um, some context confusion. Uh, I think it mixes the messages. I think it detracts from the liberty and justice for all message, which is a aspirational message and should not be seen as a rejoinder to the Black Lives Matter statement. It, it is a higher principle uh, that we found this country on and to cause it to be put in that context to serve as a, um, a statement against that, I, I don't agree with. Um, and if I have the decision, which I, I do as a voting member of the city council, uh, I don't support it. Do I support the statement, liberty and justice for all? 100%. I also wanna defend uh, Connor's right to speak uh, because that is a protected right. Uh, under a First Amendment that we ch cherish. And Connor is not, we are not judges. We are not a uh, court. Um, he does not have to recuse himself. He's an elected city official. Um, he is elected by the, the voting constituents of District 2, and he can express an opinion. Um, and just as the legislature can express opinions and can come into committee meetings, and I have faced this where I have seen legislators come into a committee and I know they're gonna vote against whatever I'm proposing. Um, and that happens uh, and it happens here. And so to impugn him or to suggest that Connor's perspective somehow taints this process, I think is unfair to the democratic process that you have before you in the city council. Uh, and I think it's uh, important to understand that Connor can express those, Mr. Casey can express those uh, sentiments and still vote, and I would support that. 
because he's a voting member of the city council. The uh, constituents of District 2 elected him. And if they disagree with him, they don't have to reelect him. Um, but as long as he's a voting member, he, he's a fair and I'll stand up for his right to express that opinion, whether I agree with it or whether I don't. Um, I think that there has been a lot of impugning and I, I won't impugn. I presume that everybody who has spoken tonight has spoken from the heart and has spoken from sincere uh, feelings uh, and beliefs. This is clearly an issue in which there are as a lot of conversation that can be had um, as it is 920 and we are still talking about it. But I think it's important to understand that as, as city councilors, we're faced with a very specific decision. And this decision is, is whether or not this particular application, this particular design fits within um, uh, uh, an approvable um, construct that we're proposed that we're faced with making that choice. And um, I've already given my opinion, and I'm just one council member, but that's where I think uh, I stand on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, see, Donna, did you want to say anything? If not, that's okay. Uh, no, I'll be, be I'll be brief because I do want a bathroom break after this. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to really thank everybody. And as Dan just said, it's part of our democracy that we all can come here and have our opinions. And as a fellow council member, thank heavens you all have opinions and all have different experiences. So I do feel the council has the right to make the decision it did. I supported it that Black Lives Matter, it should not be modified. And I do think it's the right thing to do. And I've just been absolutely personally moved every time I drive over it. And I watch cars slow down. It's, it's an inspiration. And so if we ever do any in the future, I want to have that same feeling when I drive over it. Very affirmative, very unifying. So thank you all that we did this. That's all. Thank you. Um, I agree with all of the sentiments that have been shared. Um, I, I agree particularly, Donna, that this, this feels like a, a modification of the Black Lives Matter mural. And um, while I also agree with the sentiment of liberty and justice for all, uh, the context matters, the, the context, oh, yes, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause my, my thinking just now. Jay, Jay, did you wanna jump in? <laughs> no, no, keep going, Andy. No, no, good. <laughs> you go. <laughs> but but I, I stand, you know, I, I stand with uh, all my other council members. I appreciate uh, how articulate they've been and the uh, different perspectives they bring to this argument. And uh, I stand with, with all of you. Thank you. Great. Sorry about that, Jay. Your picture is further down on my screen. Um, so, um, so I, so why I, um, very much agree with the uh, aspiration of liberty and justice for all. I think that is a, a noble uh, and uh, important uh, sentiment to be uh, pursuing as a country and as a, as a community. Um, I, the context matters. And in this case, uh, I agree that it, it detracts. Um, you know, the only, so I also want um, to, I want to thank Dan for uh, sticking up for Connor. Because um, Connor, yes, I, I agree that we all, um, it is, it is perfectly okay for any of us to share our opinions uh, about where we stand on, on any particular issue. And, and, you know, and we do listen to people and uh, you know, sometimes our opinions change when we hear from folks, but um, nonetheless, it is perfectly fine to, um, to, to hear, uh, or to, I'm sorry, to, to express uh, where we're at and what, what we think about things. So, um, so, and, and thank you for, for your bravery there, Connor, for, um, for speaking up. Um, and uh, so there's a, a couple other things that I, I wanted to just add. One is that uh, the proposal does have an American flag uh, printed on the ground, on the, on the roadway. And I will just, just wanna be on the record as saying, I'm very uncomfortable with printing uh, an American flag on the ground. Um, I know it's not a cloth flag, uh, uh, but nonetheless, with the, the flag code, uh, the, the American, the U.S. flag code, uh, not allowing the, the flag to touch the ground, it just um, really rubs me the wrong way. 
Um, and in fact, uh, just in conversations that I've had with um, other people leading up to this um, meeting, uh, came, came to find out that, that this is a, a practice of um, some other countries. They might print the flag of their enemy on the ground and then have their army mar march over it, right? So I, I do not want to have um, our flag printed on the ground. Um, I think that is uh, inappropriate. So, uh, and beyond that, I, I agree with, um, with you all. Um, and I, I don't want to really take more time than that. Um, so having said all of that, um, I think everyone now has had an opportunity to, um, to weigh in. Uh, is there anyone who would like to make a motion regarding uh, this uh, street closure? Uh, Connor. I'll move to deny the request. So I think actually- That's a point of order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, uh, go ahead, Dan. I, I, it, any motion has to be stated in the affirmative and if, if you'll allow, I would make the motion uh, to approve the uh, street closure um, that has been applied for for the Car for Governor uh, campaign. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, uh, and all in favor, please say aye. And opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, um, I believe that was unanimous, so we don't need to do a roll call. Um, and this motion uh, fails. So um, regardless, thank you everyone for uh, your, your thoughtfulness and uh, for the discussion. I think this was an important discussion um, too, and I um, certainly hope that we can uh, still strive for liberty and justice for all. Uh, I think that that sentiment uh, still is, as we've said, is still uh, deeply important to us, um, but it's not something that we're choosing to say right now as a, as a council. Uh, okay, so having said all of that, uh, it is 9.27. Uh, should we, I think we could probably take a break till 9.35. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll be back at 9.35, all right. Thanks everybody. Okay, it is 9.35 and we have, uh, I'm gonna go back and look here, four items to get through. Um, one, I, I would really, I would really appreciate not going past 10 tonight, which really means wrapping up at around um, 9.50. Um, so I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's doable team. Um, yes, Dan. I'm just, I'm happy to run through really quick the flag um, update because I think I've, I've addressed most of the issues and I can probably do it in under five. Present. Okay. I kind of want to believe that we can do this, but I, I don't know, we'll see. So Donna, go ahead. Just, I'd like to change the order. What if we put the tax stabilization last and if we don't have time, fine. There's nothing pressing about it. Sure, I think that's a great idea. Uh, okay, so we'll start with uh, the flag policy. Dan, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the version that you have most recently um, reflects uh, a couple of changes. One is um, the changes that Donna had um, asked about, sort of uh, taking out the, the mayor as a separate part of the council um, so now it's it's very much the council itself is the is the entity that approves it. I, I tried to um, clean this up a little bit. the The second big change, actually, there's three big changes. The second big change is the um, where special flags are be, to be displayed, and this is based off a conversation that I had with um, Bill, which is. Uh, there are four flagpoles in front of City Hall. There are the three that are clustered around the um, uh, police and, and service members monument. And then there's one that's actually right in front of Bill's office in City Hall that stands alone, needs a little bit of repair work with a rope. But uh, Bill and I were talking about that and thought that might be a good place to have the special flags. That way, the three flags on the right side 
would display the American flag, the state of Vermont flag, and the city of Montpelier flag. And that would just simply be that permanent display. The flag on the left would then be the special flags that we would approve. I, I've kept the language very much as far as the type of approval process that we would go through and when we determine these type of flags. Um, so that's the other that's the other change. The third change came out of a uh, thinking about um, when we put the flag at half mast and and being very clear and specific. So what I did was I this is probably the section I changed the most um, in in drafting and thinking about sort of people's feedback, which is uh, I simplified it so that it no longer has goes through all the reasons why the American flag might be put down. It just simply says um, that any and you know any call by the proper federal or state authorities will cause the flags to be flown at half mast and just leave it at that, the flag code, state flag protocol, let that control. And then it says, um, the change that I made was that in addition to any federal or state protocols or directions, the mayor or designee may order the city of Montpelier flag to be flown at half staff for one week under the following circumstances. And then I out outline on the death of any of the following individuals, the Montpelier mayor, ex-mayor, mayor elect, current member of city council or city clerk, current head of any city department, um, any other local official, city employee, or other individual deemed by the mayor to have made significant contributions to the benefit and welfare of the city and citizens of Montpelier. Um, and then the other reason why it may be flown to half mast would be any instance where a city of Montpelier employee has been killed in the line of duty or has died as a direct result of injuries incurred while in the performance of official duties. Um, and it says that the then the part three says the city manager shall state the reason or name of the individual in whose honor the flag or flags have been lowered to half staff in his or her weekly weekly report. The idea behind this and giving the mayor this power is to avoid what I think would be an uncomfortable situation, which is, say, Jane Smith dies and some people on city council think, you know, Jane Smith deserves to have this flag flown at half mast. And the other half of the city council goes, no, anyone but Jane Smith, don't like her. Um, the last thing anybody wants is to have a debate over whether or not the flag should be flown to half mast for, dece for deceased Jane Smith. Certainly not her family, certainly not the community, certainly not any counselor who might be in the awkward position of arguing against it. Let's make it the mayor who makes the call, um, you know, give, give her the authority to do so it's really just a, an, an act. And, and what I would say is that this is meant as a modest sort of tip of the hat sign of respect to somebody in the community. And we should be looking broadly. It doesn't cost us anything to put something at half mast. It doesn't, um, I think it's, it's, it's a sign of uh, respect for people who contribute to the community and we shouldn't narrowly define what those contributions mean. Does it mean somebody who contributed a bunch of money to the city, uh, who was a wealthy business person? No, not necessarily. I mean, that person may make contributions, but that may person may not have. That person may have just been a wealthy person who happened to live in the city of Montpelier. It should be for people that make contributions, and, it, and we should be looking at that broadly. Uh, whether it's somebody who just simply put in 25 years and was a great, uh, well-known community person, um, you know, in, in his or her function, as a city employee. And I, I think that, you know, that should be left to the mayor and the mayor can make those decisions. And if the mayor fumbles those decisions, well, that's what the political process is for. The voters, I don't think will make that decision whether or not to retain a mayor strictly on this, these decisions, but it's just, I think it's a part of, of the mayor's duty uh, and it avoids those debates. So that's the flag policy in a nutshell. I think it's I think it's been improved and I really appreciate uh, Donna's feedback that I think helped shape some of my thinking and how to revise this. I think it's clean. I think it's it's minimal and I think it makes you know it takes out the decision making process in this. Great. Uh, Jack. Um, a technical question. Thanks Dan. I think this is uh, a real improvement. I think that Technical question I have is: is the uh, is a separate flagpole that's in front of Bill's office shorter than the other flagpoles? So I was just about to weigh in on that. 
since I've had the conversation with Dan, we did realize that it is taller and we cannot fly the special flags higher than the US flag. Um, so we're actually looking at what it would, but so we're, now we're in a conundrum where, where the US flag and the state flag can only fly on left-hand side of the building and we can't fly anything else on this flag because they would be higher than the US flag. So we have a, a, an unusable flagpole. So we're looking at what the cost would be to replace it with a shorter one. Um, so I would suggest that the policy is just slightly amended to say either this flagpole or replacing the city flag um, as we sort our way through. Okay. Because we, we can't use this one really for any reason at this point. Right. That makes sense. I'd be perfectly comfortable with that adjustment. That's a very funny because you know the the whole reason the flag was on the, the left side, um, as Bill explained, was uh, somebody made an error when they were refurbishing the uh, plaza, and they put the flagpole on the wrong side of the building, where it's you know it's supposed to be on. If you're if you're facing out from the building, it's on the right side, and they put it on the left and didn't realize it till after the pla the pole was installed. Right. Right. Interesting. Did not know that. Then we put up the new poles, and but. Because this one's taller, we can't use it. Uh, other comments on this? Are we, if you're happy with it, then we should just keep going. Uh, Jay. I'll just say yes. I, I appreciate uh, Dan's efforts and, and Bill's efforts to make this happen. I'm totally happy with it. And also, Bill, check with Andrew LaRosa uh, in the school district because the Union Elementary flagpole came down and they're, they're not putting it back up when we did the playground. It's going to go back around the building. There's gonna there's gonna be a new one, so there may be an extra flagpole stick sitting around that we might be okay. able to use. Just saying, depending on the height, we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Uh, Donna, I just want to thank Dan for all his wonderful edits, and I'd like to make a motion that we accept the the city council flag policy as presented. Second. With the minor amendment about. Either the other flag right. or yes. I, yes, I heard you say that. Yes, yes. And then Jack is nodding in agreement. So, um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the motion carries unanimously. Uh, so um, we are on to. Uh, the coronavirus updates. Um, Tax stabilization. They moved that though. We moved it to the end. Oh, we did. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, Cameron. I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> um, I do want to update you on Lincoln Street. Um, uh, the Regular fences should be going up on Thursday. We have ordered some special fences that are a little more sturdy, a little larger and more visible. Those should be getting here either Friday or Monday. The del uh, delay is really COVID related, honestly. Um, so we will have um, fencing and cones up on Thursday so businesses can expand into the street over the weekend. And then we should have our more sturdy permanent fencing there um, up no later than Monday. Is that's our current timeline. I'll just briefly go through my memo, um, just pointing out some highlights. Um, just calling out, um, there have been rapidly increasing cases of COVID-19 throughout our country, and this is a really delicate time for our state. We're still trending um, in a positive way right now, but um, we've seen all over the country that that's a pretty delicate balance. So just reminding folks um, to keep your mask on and practice six foot physical distancing. Um, we did have some state updates beginning July 1st. Um, a couple of new states that have been approved um, that have counties that have a low enough case count that they can come to Vermont without quarantining. Only by driving, if you travel any other method, you still have to quarantine. So that includes um, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, Maryland, New Jersey, Delaware, Ohio, Virginia and Virginia. The ACCD and Department of Taxes announced that they have a new um, economic recovery grant that went live on Monday. I know quite a few folks have already applied for that. It is a um, 
max $50,000 grant that goes to businesses that have been harmed by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. It's sort of a recovery grant. Um, so that's live currently. Um, I think you heard a little bit earlier in our legislative um, discussion that there is another grant. Um, I think that's gonna come through the agency of administration and that is for municipalities. So we're looking for more information on that. They haven't given us a timeline on that as far as I have seen yet. So we will keep you updated on our um, attempts to get money. Um, they also, on July 7th, um, ACCD released new guidelines for colleges and university campuses. All students will now um, be required to be tested upon arrival and they have to sign a code of conduct agreement and colleges have been required to reduce their density in classrooms and other congregate areas. Um, I have a few city updates. Our um, playgrounds are now open um, under guidance of the state. Uh, it is use at your own risk. Um, and we are installing sanitizer stations to make that easier for folks to clean before and after they play on the playgrounds. As a note, city owned playgrounds are the ones next to the pool house and behind the senior center. Um, this is a, um, a tentative plan, but right now Parks is still currently planning for holding a limited form Parkapalooza. We're still in the works of planning that, what it would look like to make sure that it has, um, fits all the state guidelines, but, um, and we'll share that plan with you when it is completed, but I'm, I'm happy with how that planning is going and how we're going to be implementing safety procedures I think it will be a great opportunity for folks to get out of their house into our parks. And I'm sorry, hold on. And have an event to look forward to. Um, the city hall building is open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from eight to four. Um, I, that's gone well so far. We've heard no negative feedback, but it's only been um, you know, a few days at this point. Um, but otherwise that's going well. And I guess I will just skip ahead to say we're still doing well with our communications with the community and we're still getting averaging just under a thousand interactions with all of our social media posts. So I think that that's going really well. Um, we're continuing posting the weekly reports onto um, Front Porch Forum, which was honestly a weird oversight, but it's just one of those that happens and we fixed it and people have given some really positive feedback for receiving that information in a different format. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know, it, and it feels like this gets shorter and shorter, but it's bizarre because I feel like we're operating within a new normal. And so there's less things to really report because we're just sort of holding the line on this. Um, and the state has slowed down updates a little bit, um, but I'll keep you abreast of the grant opportunities that we've been finding. Great, um, Connor. I just want to thank city staff, uh, DPW, the fire department, and the city manager's office for the Langdon Street closure. I think like every time you tried to do it, something else came up, but you were very creative. And uh, I know it's going to mean a lot for the businesses to get that up and running this weekend. Agreed. And um, yeah, thanks for working on uh, um, other things like Park of Palooza and getting things uh getting back to a sense of normalcy it's great um okay uh so uh, the next item would be uh the tks discussion and i, I because we are skipping the 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 second july meeting um and this is an item for which the clock is ticking i feel like we should at least just get an update from bill and maybe like just run through like your one sentence reaction. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what do you, uh, how do you feel about it real quick? So Bill, go ahead. Sure, and I tried to, I try, thank you. I, I tried to address this pretty succinctly in the cover memo. So most everything that needs to be said is there. Um, obviously we have a December one deadline to, to deal with this property with regard to the state and we have to pay $130,000 or, or they need to, recapture $130,000 in our federal highway funds. And for the, if people want more background on that, I'd be happy to give it to them, not right now. Um, so really the options, there's really three choices for us. One, we pay them $130,000. We then own the property outright. We're, we're clear of our, our 
obligation to them. We can use it as we see fit and we can sell it at a later date and retain any profits or absorb any losses. We can sell the property now in conjunction with the state. We can tell them we'd like to sell it as a way to pay you back. And they would partner with us on that. And there's a process that they would use, an open public process, which is fine. We should do it that way anyway. But in that case, if we make over $130,000, the state keeps all those additional proceeds, which go for federal funding. If we, if we don't, if we have a shortfall, the city still has to make up the difference. So under, unlike the first scenario, we're, on, we're still on the hook for the loss, but we don't get the potential profit in the future. So under either one or two, we still have the same loss risk, but we only have a gain risk on the, on the first one. The third thing we could do is just say, you know what, we're not, we don't have the money, we're, we, don't, we don't want to take the risk just take it back. It's your property back again. Uh, it's, you know, the state would control it. They could then sell it themselves and, you know, reimburse themselves. They could use it for whatever transportation purposes that they saw fit. They could make it parking. They could put a salt pile there. They could, you know, we would lose control of the parcel. So, um, so those are our choices. Now, from a business perspective, to me, the smartest choice is to buy it. Um, because then we have full control of everything and we have, you know, we have the same downside risk, but we have an upside, potential upside benefit. The problem is we don't really know right now, you know, we're just cutting $1.4 million off our budget. Where are we going to get $130,000? Um, my purpose for putting this on the agenda <coughs> was simply to get this back on our radar, <coughs> excuse me, and to see if you all had any preference. My recommendation is that we buy it. If, the, if that's what you'd like to see us do, then the direction would be that we come back with a, an analysis at the next meeting in a month and say, here's our best shot at how we think we can find the money. If you would rather do one of the other two, then we'll set those wheels in motion. Okay, uh, Dan. Uh, Bill, has there been any appraisal of the, the value of the lot? There was when we first uh, did this, which is partly how this number came about. It, it gets a little, and that is something we would look at. It gets a little bit more complicated because when we purchased this lot, it was one of three lots. They've since been re sub, as you probably know, they've been resubdivided into two lots. So the combined lot is more valuable that because that does, actually includes the parking lot in the back. Uh, so we could always resubdivide it back, maybe, um, to uh, represent what it was. But um, at any at any rate, my, our, we had a deal to sell it for three hundred and some odd thousand dollars with the Moat Trust. I'd have to get the exact number, and it would have more than repaid the state interest. And, and sure. at that point, the balance was going to go into the car lot project. Um, right. I, I, I mean, I ask it, you know, because I think I think there's a number of, of strong reasons to purchase to find a way to purchase the lot, which is, you know, it's it's a key parcel as you come into town on Main Street, um, you know, to have the ability to control what goes there, um, I think is is critical, whether it's a park, whether it's a commercial building, whether it's parking, whatever we choose to put, you know, as you pointed out, if we own it, we can decide what that is as opposed to if somebody else owns it like the state and decides to put a uh, salt pile there or railroad car holding containment center there um you know anything else that that you know we would not we might not want um but it it strikes me that the one sort of risk is you know if we put in 130,000 and we can't get that 130,000 out of it you know you we we overpay for the lot um and that would be simply, I'd, I'd want to know whether that's sort of maintained its its value, if not grown. Um, yeah, I, but we also, well, we have that risk. If we sell it with the state and we don't get 130,000, then we still have to pay the shortfall. Right. No, I, under, I understand that. I mean, it's just, I think it's just something that we can see if we can calculate, you know. And, it was... There was an appraisal done on the new combined lot. It's, it's old now, but I can 
find it. And it's it's well in excess of this amount. I want to say it's 300 something. Okay, then, you know, I- uh, But I'll, I'll get that number for you. When we discuss this at the next meeting. Otherwise, and I see that as a minor point. I, I, I really think it, it, I fully support purchasing this lot if we can. Um, Jay, then Donna. Sure, I, I just want to say that I, I fully support Bill's uh, recommendation that the city, well, that he, um, you know, research the, the financial feasibility of the city purchasing the lot. Um, to echo what Dan said, I think that it is a, uh, a really uh, key and important piece of property as people come right into the city. It's a piece of property that um, has access to the river. Um, and we have very few of those um, available to us as a city to think about how we might use them. Um, and obviously, it feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, it was a couple months ago that we were talking about the downtown core master plan. And this was certainly a key property in talking about uh, building connections to the rivers and green space and particularly a riparian buffer around the rivers for the city. So um, I just want to re reiterate what Dan said in supporting Bill's um, recommendation that we move forward with the feasibility of purchasing the lot. Thank you. Donna. Uh, yeah, and I, I look at the council and Ann and I were the only ones on when this started and it was such a different story going on, but I've definitely continued my commitment to buy the lot and control it, whether that's park or building on it or selling it. But I think we don't have any options, good options without trying to find the money to buy it. So I support buying it for sure. Uh, Jack. I agree with what's been said. I've see, we've seen, I don't know what should go there, but we've seen some uh, very attractive ideas, both in the area of uh, real estate development and in parkland. And uh, the only way we maintain those options and the ability to control it is to buy it if we can. So I'd like to see us try to do that. Connor. Yep, I agree too. It's like going around the Monopoly board and you only have like 200 bucks. But you got to buy park place if you land on it, right? It's a, you know, <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good analogy. Um, Lauren, you want to, you, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Yeah, no, I, I just agree with the general sentiment and also was excited by some of the designs we saw and having the ability to, you know, really think critically about that piece like right in a important part of our downtown it makes a lot of sense to me so support that move yeah um i agree i think the interesting question will be what you what city staff comes up with as a recommendation for how we go about purchasing it uh i mean one possibility is that we bond for it as far as bonds go that would be a pretty small bond and yet I'm not sure that um, there's public appetite for that i think we we may need to ultimately make a decision about if that's the direction we go, but I'll be curious if we end up, if one of the options is taking it from uh, the FY21 budget, uh, then, or do we take it out of reserves? Well, if, if we take it out of 21 budget, where does that, what get, what further gets cut? Um, or do we take it out of reserve uh, if we can? I think we could, but anyway. Um, so is that clear enough direction there, Bill? I'm going to assume. Okay, super duper. Absolutely. I guess the only thing I'd say is that it's probably more like Oriental Avenues than Park Place. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so Vermont Avenue. Oh, Vermont <laughs> Avenue. There no, no, go. it's the orange pieces. You always have to grab the orange block in Monopoly. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I used this analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I was you know, just sure that was Park Place right there. Suddenly I have this desire to play Monopoly with you all, um, but in another time. That retreat. <laughs> exactly, or we'll have to warn it though, you know, obviously. Uh, so I think that, so we're, that was a great suggestion about putting off the tax stabilization piece. It's not exactly urgent, so we'll put that on a, on a future meeting, no? We could pass it in a minute, right, Jack? Is it is it controversial? <laughs> Anyone have comments about it? I don't, I, mean, I don't think it's controversial. I don't think it's controversial either, to be honest. 
Um, does anyone have either objections or suggestions? Okay, go ahead, Donna. I just found it a little confusing because instead of striking, you had two policies. So I didn't see it all that different. And I wasn't one of the ones who was really pushing for it. So does anybody on the council remaining on the council was really looking to change the tax stabilization policy? Uh, I, I was. Yeah, I was as well. <laughs> but I go ahead, Bill. And you think this does it? Yeah, yes. I think it was, it was clumsy. One, there were a number of things that were clumsy about it. So what we tried to do is, uh, you know, Jack, you know, feel free to jump in here, was to make it pretty simple. So now there's really just one. If you get tax stabilization, you get it for five years for 50%. There's none of this, let's decide how much they get. And then there's very clear things that you can pick up an extra year if you do them. And those are really where the things that I think the council had said were its key priorities and not um, Kind of find them here in the uh, you know so either they deed a right of you know sort of an easement that we need or it's uh, meets some exceptional standard or you know it's going to add 15 more residential units or you know so it's got a, it's got a series of things it's, it uh, meets energy efficiency standards it uh, provides a number of employees so you can get an extra year for each of those once you meet the basics instead of having the council have to sort of decide what someone's earned, it's just pretty clear. Here it is, here's what you get. Um, and the other thing was there were, you remember recall the last one had a but for clause that they had to prove that, and, and we found that to be very problematic. So that's out. Uh, I thought there was still up, a line in there that said that. Not in the new one, I don't believe. Yeah, it's one of the, uh, go ahead, keep talking, but it, it is still in there, Bill. It's, um, go ahead. Uh, it's after the um, DRB approval, it's, but before the building permit. Pops up as, as one of the extra criteria. I, I just I just did a word search, and the only place but four appears is in the older version on page eleven of the of the draft, which I think reflects the two thousand three version. Right. Yeah, so we, ch we wanted to change that um, and we, we wanted to be, I think, clear about the recapture and um, just, you know, make it a little bit simpler to use. The other key policy thing, though, which is what has held us up for this, all this time, was the TIF district. And um, the, the prior, the 2003 policy really tried to encourage uh, and, and reward development in the, the designated downtown and the growth center. Um, and those really are all included in the TIF district now. What we've learned from VEPSI is at least until the legislature makes some changes that if we grant tax stabilization in the TIF district, basically the rest of the city has to make up the difference in the lost taxes, we can increase our tax rate. And, and really they, they advised us against doing that so this policy says you can't get it if you're in the TIF district. It doesn't even say if you're getting TIF benefits, it just it exempts anything in the district. And I think for now, that's what we, what we have to do based on what we know. We're hoping that those regulations will change a little at the state level, um, and maybe we'll learn a better way to do it. But for now, this seems like the cleanest way to do it. So this is really dealing with properties outside of our core downtown to try to encourage development there so it's pretty straightforward so jack you, wanna, you were the chair of the committee um i should point out that it was a working group not a committee because the working group is not subject to the open meeting act, whereas a committee or subcommittee is um and so we specifically called it a working group when we set it up but we we would we'd get into these conversations where it was complicated and it, nobody could tell whether they were going to get the uh, tax stabilization or not. And uh, it was all a matter of judgment. And then there was screwy stuff like we had this but for provision where they had to prove that they would not make the do the project but for the uh, getting the tax stabilization. But you had to have your permit in hand before you could apply. And so that made no sense at all. Um, and so 
it having it be pretty mechanical and clear is a way to to address some of these problems and um, at one point there was at least one person from the uh, maybe more from the public sector uh, involved in the working group and I think we all thought it was, this was an improvement Um, I had, um, I, I realize this is like a minor thing, but I just want to point out um, in the um, language and the um, under, I guess it would be, well, it's on, it's on page, where did it go? I just lost it. On page five, uh, it's under nine. I guess it's, well, I don't know where nine went. Um, it's really a... Oh yeah, we are missing a nine. We're missing nine. Um, well, regardless, um, it's like eight, five, the net, it's the net zero standard one. Um, so I just wanna point out that um, the energy efficiency, uh, well, I just want to point out that there is no such thing as uh, the city's net zero standards. Um, so I would recommend replacing that uh, with uh, uh, Vermont's residential building energy standard stretch code uh, or a LEED certification. For if that's okay. Buildings. What's that? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So either stretch code or lead since we don't, you know, we don't we don't have our own standards. So that would be an amendment. Yeah. Got it. Um. Uh, Jack. So you need a motion. Yes. You need a motion to sure. Amendment. We move that we uh, amend uh, section eight one C. No, no, maybe it's just eight to five. I think it's just eight five. Two. Yeah, uh, to uh, to say the energy efficiency of the new development meets the uh, state residential energy stretch standard. Is that stretch code? Stretch code, or or uh, uh, achieves lead certification of any level. Okay, at any level. Okay, okay. That's the motion. Okay. Uh, Jay. Um, do you, do you... Oh, okay, you're good. Okay. Um, second. Okay, we've got a second. Um, further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. All right, so the motion passes. Uh, all right, I think that is um, all of our business. Uh, so council reports, I'm gonna start with Donna. Well, I like to talk. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, Jack, did you have something? That was, that was just a motion to amend this uh, good proposed. Call. Thank you. And then the question. Were you sure I, it wasn't a motion to include the amendment? <laughs> <laughs> good call, good call, that's, that's no, I, proper. I had the yeah, same Dan. I had the same question. So I'll make a motion to adopt the uh, revised city tax stabilization policy um, as amended. I'll second it. Okay. We got a motion and a second. Um, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. Uh, all right. So we have a new tax stabilization policy. Yay. We did it properly. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, now on to council reports. Uh, Donna. Okay, I missed the making the agenda, but I would like us to talk at our next meeting about the upgrade of the parking meters. Uh, that given the parking enforcement staff, they really feel we don't understand why we need to do this. And I also feel that August is time to start making people pay again. And since we're not going to meet again, so it won't be till mid-August, but at least by the 1st of September. And the meter enforcement staff agrees they really feel there are a lot of cars on the road and they should be putting money in. So 
I'd like us to discuss that at our next meeting. So be thinking about it. Okay. And I want to wish Anne to have a wonderful time <laughs> getting married. <laughs> I expect to see lots of photos on face on your Facebook. All right. There will be lots of photos. No worries. Best wishes. <laughs> Thank Best you. Get, get your mayoral portrait done when you're like all dutied up. <laughs> right. That'll be, that'll be that'll be the portrait. That'll be the one that hangs for eternity. Right. Exactly. That'll be super funny. In stark contrast with every other one. No, um, uh, okay, uh, Connor. Oh, not, not too much. I uh, just wanted to say, I thought that was a great discussion with the uh, delegation there. Um, and I, hopefully that's the first of many conversations uh, that's gonna build a closer relationship. So that was, that was really cool. And, and then just on a personal note, I want to thank everybody for getting my back tonight during the previous discussion. That, that meant a lot, so thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Jay. Um, just, I'll, yeah, just congrats, Anne, ahead of time. Um, Thank you. And, and also, uh, I just wanted to uh, have been out and about and, and, and doing things and starting to see city staff um, more involved. I was at, out at Two Rivers early this morning, the Five Home Farm Way, and saw Alec and a bunch of um, uh, 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 park staff ahead of uh, Bob's um, uh, doing the doing the, the updated inspection and so just thankful for staff start I know we're not all back on everybody's back but thankful that people are are starting to phase back in and get back to work and provide services um, for the city and uh, it's it's uh, uh, definitely noticed so thank you thank you uh, Dan um, I'll add to the congratulations and I'll just note there's an article recently, the bigger the wedding, the shorter the marriage. So keep it small. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on a good track there then. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll raise is, is, um, that, uh, you know, I think we should be putting on our sort of radar, the idea of public bathrooms, because I think we've talked about it before as a council. And I think in the wake of COVID-19 that we need to revisit it um, and how that, what that looks like, you know, and, and what kind of project it, it, it does. It's, it's worthy of discussion because I don't think it's, it's, it's not just a issue for the homeless population. I think it's an issue for any visitors to the city. Um, you know, we used to be able to rely on a network of public and private spaces that we can't rely upon anymore. Um, and so we should be really giving some consideration to that because we want to make sure that our city is welcoming to people who want to come and spend their hard earned money and increase our revenue as a city. So um, I think that anything we can do to help that is a good thing. Um, just thinking about that, I mean, I, I think that's a worthwhile um, thing to discuss. Are you suggesting that that's a, uh, like an agenda item for a future meeting? Yes, I, okay. I would suggest that it's an agenda item for a future meeting. Um, you know, whether, what type of, of action we would need to do or plan, I think it's at least worthy of being warned and having a discussion about it. Great, fair enough. Um, okay, Jack. All right, thank you. Uh, and Lauren. Um, wanted to share that the um, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has moved forward with um, hiring a, a contractor to work with on our equity and justice work. So I'll keep you all posted on kind of what next steps, but certainly that's community engagement and engagement for us all. So really excited that that's moving forward and just appreciative again that in these really tough budget times that um, you all prioritize that and uh, are moving forward with those important conversations. So really excited about that. Um, wanted to thank John Odom and the city clerk's office. I know they've been working incredibly hard with the huge influx of um, mail-in ballot requests and encourage everyone to keep up their requests so we can have nice safe elections, but um, appreciate the, all the hard work that's going into getting those out to people. Um, and I know there's opportunities to volunteer if anyone <laughs> wants, but it sounds like there's a lot of good people stepping up. Um, and that just wrap up with a congrats to Anne as well. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, well, thank you, everybody. And uh, so I just have a couple of things on my radar. One is that I will never ask you to buy gift cards <laughs> ever. And I'm really sorry if you ever got emails from me asking you to do that. I've changed my e my password like multiple times. Don't know why it happens. Uh, left them in your office, Sarah. It's so <laughs> nice. Do with all the ones I bought. Come on. They're, they're not, they're not they're nice. They're not them all for your wedding. I guess no, right? That makes sense. <laughs> they're not oh, your email. Yeah, What's they're that? not coming from your emails. They're coming from like <laughs> random Gmail accounts. They're just pretending to be you. Right. You catch one of us not paying attention. I <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the, but the second thing, more serious on a more serious note, um, is just uh, want to recognize um, that Chief Pete has been having these uh, town hall style meetings, inviting uh, the public to come have a conversation, have conversations with him about uh, policing. And I just want to thank him for doing that. I think that is the right thing to do. And I also know that those can be, um, you know, tough conversations. And I just appreciate that he is doing the tough right thing. And um, if you would just pass that on to him, our, our gratitude. And, oh, and he's got another one coming up, I think, right? In July. Tomorrow night. Yeah. Tomorrow night. Okay. Tomorrow night. And I'm sure you'll, maybe you'll tell us more about the details for that, but. Or, or maybe it's available on the um, Facebook page, et cetera, how to, how to access that. And that's it for me. Uh, John. Um, without going into great detail, the ballots are coming in and um, at a fast and furious rate. Um, it's looking more like maybe more than we could absorb, but I think we've changed things around and we're gonna be just dandy, but we're gonna be setting records on early ballots for sure. Um, I should have a plan on what the election, the logistics of the election are gonna look like based on, you know, everybody's doing stuff differently now because of COVID, but I've looked at a lot of the other clerks plans and I, I think I have something good in consultation with Bill and Cameron um and kelly that will uh work pretty well so i'll uh i'll want to get out something under front porch form when i actually get that firmly written down but it should be by the end of the week great thanks um bill quickly um donna raised the parking meters and, and uh, that is an issue which we talked about i think a while back and has dropped but just so you're aware we got the the current smart meters, if they are, you call them that, the credit card meters would be about five years ago free because they were being discontinued. And so we were able to get them. We had to chip them and install them, but we got them all free. Well, one of the reasons we got them free was that they were the old model. And uh, so technology-wise, technology they will not really be uh, that functional after December. So we're looking at having to replace them and that will not be free. And that's in the $200,000 range. Uh, and, and we can maybe lease them over four years, lease to purchase and those kinds of things. But we are not generating any parking revenue, which would be a source of funds. We have been looking at when to restore parking. Um, there are a lot of people on the streets, um, but we don't know how many of them are, are just employees that are parking there because they can now. We can park all day and go work at their business and how many are actual shoppers. So we're, one of the ideas we were talking about was to go back to on-street parking, but keep the lots all free and see how that works for maybe in August. So um, we may need, I don't know if we'll need a special vote from you all on that, but we're, we're, we're looking at that. Um, but we, we'd like to get our folks back to work, but only if it's really necessary. Uh, we also don't wanna create a chilling effect on the downtown fragile time and we don't want to create a disincentive for people to come so uh it's a fine balance we're trying to you know it looks like many of the other communities that have meters are charging um so we'll see we're, we're trying to be cautious there um you will need speaking of special meetings we will need a special meeting ideally for next tuesday just to set the tax rate which is really a mathematical computation but um, I won't be here, but Cameron will, will be here, but it really takes about two minutes. So if we could do a call in or a Zoom if you all want to pick the time. Um, okay. 
Don't everybody jump at once. I'm, I'm, I'm open anytime. Um, would this be something to do on like the lunch hour? We could do it at lunch. We could do it at five o'clock. We could do it at 630. You know, we do it really whatever works for people. Literally, we'll probably send out either Friday or Monday the final calculation. I mean, it's really the budget that passed, the grand list, the state education. You know, it's not, there's not a lot of leeway with the count. You know, it's not really much discretion you have, but you still have to vote to set the tax rate, the water and sewer rates, et cetera. Uh, so, lunch reading would work better for me. Lunch? Yeah. Lunch here, too. Yes, to lunch hour. Yeah. Noon, Can Tuesday. Tuesday, yep. Yeah. Um, could we either like 12 or 12.30? Sure. Um, Take the time, folks. We can do it whenever you want. Okay. Um, Lauren, I'm not sure I saw a thumbs up from you. What's up? Yeah. I'm going to be at a cabin where I think there might be no cell service or internet. <laughs> it looks like there's going to be a corner. But <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of it. Sure. No worries. We'll solve it. <laughs> Um, let's just go with noon, if that's amenable to folks. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank Great. you. And then, um, so Jay did mention that uh, we did do the follow-up inspection at Five Home Farm Way, and there really was no change. So I think our strategy of hanging tight and letting the other party sort it out uh, continues to be the, the prudent one for us. Um, and Lauren mentioned the social and economic justice. Uh, moving forward with their pro processing, that contract will be on the next agenda for approval. So it will officially really kick things off. And yes, Chief Pete is having another meeting. I don't have all the Zoom uh, details, but it is at 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, it's calling it a virtual town hall. Um, it is on our Facebook. And if you want me to um, forward it to y'all, I'll do that as well. That's all I have. Okay. Um, great. I think that's it. Right. No one's we we've finished all of our business. So um, without objection, we will um, consider the meeting adjourned 1025. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.